Hi, Elizabeth. Hi. Hi, you can hear me? Yes. Okay. Would you like to be one of the co-hosts for today's meeting? No, it's Bill and Rob Jacob. Okay. I've been kicked off. Yeah. No, I knew I knew that, but I just didn't know whether if you had some some role that would require you. Um, nope. Nope. The host. No, you get to okay. sit back and just participate. Oh yeah. Yes. 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 I just can we just test that my screen is sharing? Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. We can do that for for anyone who would like to. Okay. Just so the green button at the bottom. Everything okay. sharing now. Yeah, yeah, you'll just want to put it in presenter mode. Absolutely. Okay. Stop yeah. share. Mm -hmm. That's a good test. I mean, I've been using Zoom so much lately. Yes. Okay. Oh, I can actually start my video. Now, are you going to, um, we should have our videos off and our mutes off on when we're not presenting. Yes, that's the recommended practice. That'd be okay. great. Hi, Bill. Hey, Bill. Hello. Are so you excited? Already, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm excited that this is the last one. So. Oh, God, I can imagine. You've, you've done a great job, Elizabeth, you and everyone else. Like this is, everything I've been in has run so smoothly. Uh, for such a large virtual meeting, this is, pretty impressive so yeah. thank you for thank you oh totally ditto for me good well we're glad to hear that it's been a, a huge team effort with the support from from isg staff they've all been very hands-on and making sure that technology happens behind the scenes so we are streaming on youtube now and um we'll go from there when everyone's ready That's pretty, is that an option in Zoom to stream to YouTube? <laughs> or is there something else you have to do to make that happen? Oh, I'm gonna shut the door. I didn't hear that, Rob, hold on. <clears throat> Were you asking about YouTube? Yeah, I was just curious how that worked. Is that a Zoom option or you have to do something else? To... There is some behind the scenes settings that have to be in place and you have to have a a YouTube account, but I can send you the instructions. We've figured that out and we've already shared that as well with some NOAA cooperators. You know, that was our workaround for anyone with NOAA that wasn't allowed to use Zoom. So okay. to do that streaming option. So yeah, once the meeting gets started, I'll send that to you. So if you have questions, sure. you can let us know. We're happy to share everything we've learned the hard way. <laughs> yeah, that's great, thank you. Elizabeth, should I go ahead and share my screen or is there anything you wanted to do first? I just have a few welcome slides. Uh, no, you can anything? go ahead and okay. share share the okay. welcome. That's fine. We've just got okay. a few more minutes. Yep. Yeah, it's good. We've got 23 people already, so. Can folks see this see the slide now? Yes. Yes. 
And after the meeting, if there's any slides that you want to have posted to the to the meeting website, go ahead and send them to me. Great, yeah. Mariana, are you feeling pangs of emptiness right now? Oh my God, yes. Just like, please let me be the one, yes. You don't get to stand up in front of a group of people and vibe. This is so sad. <laughs> How are you feeling, Bill? Are you feeling excited about this? Oh yes, it's been my lifelong dream. <laughs> to have this role. <laughs> You have nothing left to live for now. <laughs> is there any sarcasm in that? I'm not sure. No, 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 no. <laughs> this has been, this is the <laughs> pinnacle of, of Bill's achievements in life. Getting a PhD was nothing compared to this. All right, we'll give people just another minute or so to show up, I think, and then get rolling. <clears throat> All right, well, I guess I'll get underway. Um, uh, so I'm Bill Sachs. I'm in the CESM Software Engineering Group at NCAR and CGD. And uh, I and uh, the other co-chair of the uh, Software Engineering Working Group, Rob Jacob, who's at Argonne National Lab, I uh, wanna welcome you to the this session. Thanks for joining us digitally. Um, uh, so, Briefly, as you've probably seen the agenda, just uh, to remind you, we'll have a, we'll have a number of uh, talks in the first half of the session, and then we'll uh, up until about 2.30, and then we'll uh, have a little break and reconvene uh, where Gary will give a, a talk on model output, it, and then that'll lead into a um, large discussion on uh, mod managing model output for CESM3. We're looking forward to that lively discussion later this afternoon. So just a few logistics before we get started. Um, this meeting will be recorded and I just realized is, yeah, I guess it's the recording has started. Uh, everything you say will be recorded for posterity. Um, please make sure your microphone is muted when you're not talking. Um, and both for questions for speakers and then later in the, discuss in the discussion session, um, just to keep things organized, uh, please try to use the either the raise hand feature, which you can access via the participants button and then the raise hand button uh, in your Zoom interface, or by typing any question or comment into the chat. And um, Rob and I will try to uh, follow those both of those uh, means. And then just for for speakers, um, I'll give you about a one minute warning. Uh, in your talk when it's time to start wrapping up and leave a, to try to leave a few minutes uh, for questions for each speaker. Um, and then finally, just want to remind you of the code of conduct uh, for this and, and other meetings. So please try to uh, offer constructive feedback, share the air, acknowledge teamwork, encourage innovation, show appreciation, 
and consider new ideas with your discussion. All right, with that, I will stop sharing. And our first, uh, our first speaker is Mariana. Um, so Mariana, if you wanna share your screen, Okay, and I'm gonna go into presenter mode. Is this good? Yes. All right, should I start? Yeah, go ahead. Um, all right, thank you everybody for joining. Um, I'm going to give a summary of a new coupling infrastructure that is coming into CSN called CMEPS. Uh, community uh, mediator for earth prediction systems. And I'll be going into a lot more detail as to what this is. And I've, I've given some of these uh, overviews in the past, but I'm going to try to make it both basic and advanced. So for a wide range of, of listeners who might not have heard this aspects of this talk before. And I do want to acknowledge several key people that have helped with the creation of CMAPS, Jim Edwards, Ufu Turunkulu, Rocky Dunlap and Bob Unke. So basically my outline is going to be, I'm going to cover what is CMEPS, what are its benefits to CSM, what is its current status, and then I'm going to delve very briefly into a very new effort that I think is going to be really beneficial for new science coming into CSM, which is what we call CDEPS, hot off the press, or community data models for earth prediction systems. And that's just, it, it's something that will be CMEPS compliant. So what is CMEPS? And before we dive into CMEPS, I'm just gonna give a two second overview of ESMF and UOPSI, which is the language that CMEPS is built on top of. So for those of you that don't know, ESMF or the Earth System Modeling Framework is an open source software for building Earth system applications. And basically it provides standard component interface and other high performance utilities for grid remapping online and parallel communication. Even though it has offline capabilities, it is commonly used as a coupling infrastructure layer for modeling systems. And that's our primary usage of that in CMEPS. But most importantly, it is the de facto coupling infrastructure between components for models from the Navy, NOAA, NASA, and upcoming now will be CSM. So what new OPSI is, it stands for National Unified Operational Prediction Capability. That's quite a mouthful. It's simply a software layer on top of ESMF. So if you could kind of view it as ESMF plus. And what it defines is out of the box building blocks for generating coupled models and conventions for them. The key point is that it simplifies the ability to have interoperability of model components across multiple coupled systems. And I'll go into a bit more detail of what new OPSI is in some of these upcoming slides. So let's first start with what our current coupling infrastructure is. Uh, CSN, the communication between components is called a hub and spoke architecture. So the components don't exchange information directly with each other. They communicate with what we call a coupler or a mediator that does things like regridding or merging. Uh, between a set of source fields and then sends them off to the destination component. So to have any component communicate with our coupler, they need to have what's called a cap, which is simply a translation layer, translating between the model data types to the uh, mediator data types and vice versa. And one key aspect of CSM is that you can easily swap out what we call data models, for prognostic components when you do this so that you can eliminate feedbacks in the system and do what we call hierarchical model development, which is selectively turn on feedbacks as you develop your component. So what is CMEPS? Well, we're going to take the central circle and the arrows, and that's what we call the CMEPS mediator. And what you need then to communicate with the CMEPS mediator is you need to have what's called new OPSI caps in your component. 
So once you've put the new OPSI caps in, your component becomes CMEPS compliant. And like before, you can easily swap out data components for prognostic components, and the data components will have new OPSI caps. But it also brings in the ability to have a lot more uh, components that are CMEPS compliant, hence the name community. So what do we mean by the name community mediator? We, it is a community because it is a collaboration between NCAR and two NOAA labs, NOAA EMC and NOAA GFDL. It is openly developed on GitHub with the ability to encourage community code contributions as well as collaboration. It is a mediator. So by that, we mean that it's a coupler designed to flexibly couple configurations of atmosphere, land, ocean, wave, sea ice, land ice components, where we use a hub and spoke architecture. And it's targeted for earth prediction systems like CSM, but also NOAA's unified forecast system is adopting it for their seasonal to uh, subseasonal application, which is going to go into operations, as well as their hurricane forecast system, which will enable a lot more regional, including nested uh, moving grids in CMEPS. So this is a CSM box. So now I want to focus on what are the benefits of CMEPS to CSM? And there's a lot. Sorry. Okay, so what CMEPS is, is that uh, what NUOPSI is, is that it introduces four basic building blocks that facilitate and standardize how you generate coupled models. And those are a driver, a model component in yellow, a mediator in red, and connectors that enable the components to talk to the mediator in green. And this, of course, is a targeted hub and spoke architecture. So what is new capabilities introduced by Neopsy? For the mediator, it's going to enable parallel online generation of mapping weights. Currently, the way MCT and our Coupler 7 does it is you need to generate the mapping weights between the components offline and then store them in an XML file that gets bigger and bigger. That is no longer going to be needed because all of the mapping weights, except for maybe one or two customized ones like river runoff to ocean are going to be generated at runtime. In addition, it's going to enable us to have new grid capabilities, such as the exchange grid option in the mediator, which is something people have wanted for a long time to look at the atmosphere ocean flux calculation that would not just be computed on the ocean grid as an option, but on the union of the atmosphere and ocean grid. What about the driver? That's the blue. Currently in MCT and our current coupler infrastructure, the driver and the coupler are really not separate. They're two, they're conjoined. With new OPSI, they really become totally separate entities. You can have multiple drivers that all talk to one mediator. So one nice thing about uh, new OPSI is that it enables you to have a very, very simple run sequence that is an ASCII file, and that it doesn't have to be pre-compiled code. Another really nice thing is that these connectors in green are auto-generated for you. There is no code that does it that you have to create. Nuopsy does it for you. And there is a lot of optimization options, including reference sharing and new component level threading that we've been putting in. So here's just a picture. If you heard of the talk that Gokhan gave on Monday. He talked about how new regionally refined grids uh, are, or global grids with regional refinement is what I mean, are a real priority coming up for CSM model development. And having CMEPS in place will really facilitate that because you'll be able to introduce these grids and then do the regridding between components on the fly without having to go through the steps of storing and calculating all the mapping files for this new grid. I think one of the nicest things is that you're going to have a very small ASCII run sequence as opposed to several thousand lines of complex code. The entire driver run sequence ingested as an example by a file that is not much bigger than this. 
So CMEPS, the scripting infrastructure seam has been tied into CMEPS to automatically generate this one sequence and it's created when you use NuOpsy uh, in your executable root as a file called nuopsy.run sequence. Um, once you get used to the syntax, it does become a simple syntax for specifying driver looping structure and order of component execution. Components can have multiple run sequences and you can change the run sequence without recompiling, which is extremely useful for debugging as well as for examining the effects of lags in the system. And finally, as with our current driver, you can have sequential and concurrent execution that is configurable at runtime. And that, if assuming you don't have your PE layout change, should not change answers. So what does this run sequence really mean? Um, if you look here at the top uh, level, you have multiple times frequencies for the driver looping structure. These are the coupling frequencies for the ocean, which in this case, the ocean is coupling in at half an hour or 1800 seconds, and the inner loop is coupling in at 900 seconds. When you see these arrows in the run sequence, that means send data via a connector from the mediator to the atmosphere. So, and do it via redistribution of the, oops, sorry, redistribution of the data. The nice thing is that Nuopsy creates these connectors for you automatically. That was in MCT, there was a ton of code in place in the driver code to create these connectors. You don't need that. Once you put these connectors in your run sequence, they are automatically generated and there's no user code that needs it. Uh, another thing is that, frankly, here with the mediator, you see that there's different mediator phases, uh, such as merging to the ocean and doing a fast accumulation. These are the same name as the subroutines, and Nuopsy knows how to translate this into function pointers that are then called. So what is the current state of CMEPS and CSN? At this point, we have all prognostic and data components that have the caps. So we can now do hierarchical model development. This is done in parallel to the MCT driver. We have, and, and the new OPSI driver is brought in to the SIEM system when you create a SIEM checkout right now. And there is an option to have new OPSI as your uh, driver and mediator for any component. So we have done a careful validation for MOM6 using core forcing configuration, and as well as a careful validation for data components. And we're gonna start with an extensive validation for all of the CSM components of summers. So all the plumbing is in place. We've done a lot of tests already, but we have not finished the validation, which has to be very robust before we say, this is something that is ready to be brought as the default way we're gonna be running CSM. At the same time that we have now put this into CSM, NOAA has used the exact same mediator and has been working on it and finding issues with it and then getting back to us and helping us put changes in for two applications. There is an application that runs their cube sphere atmosphere called the UFS atmosphere with MOM6 and both size five and six. And that is what's going to go into their operational structure with CMAPS. And there is an upcoming hurricane application, which is a new application using their atmosphere model with an ocean component called PyCom and a very recent version of Wave Watch 3. And this is going to enable not just regional grids, but grids with moving nest and one coupling infrastructure. So we, as part of not just validating CMEPS, we are also bringing in new components that are CMEPS compliant. We have a new CMEPS compliant cap for size six, and we are gonna be sharing that with the UFS like we share our MOM6 cap. There, uh, Bill mentioned this on Monday, there is a new river model called Miserout that is coming into CSTTSN. And it runs on unstructured grids with hydrological response units. We've created a cap for it and are experimenting with it. And currently, the plan is just to develop a new OPSI cap for Mizura because we like to leverage all of the online regritting capabilities to couple Mizura to the land model and the ocean. Uh, 
So Baylor Fox Kemper and Helen Kershaw at Brown have been looking at new coupling of size to a much more recent version of the Weight Watch 3 code base than we have with the CSM uh, release. And in this coupling scenario, what uh, Wave Watch is sending to SICE is actually a wave elevation spectrum of 25 frequencies, as well as the CI stress. One really nice thing of ESMF, and this is not duopsy, this is in fact ESMF, is that you can bundle each of these frequencies as an ungridded, undistributed dimension in the field bundle that you switch back and forth. So rather than introducing 25 new fields, you're actually bundling all of these frequencies into one field and CMAPS knows how to deal with that. So it maps them all at once. Um, and Mariana, about one more. Yes. Okay, I'm almost done. So uh, in addition, HICOM is also being added as a regional model into the system. And the nice thing for this is that we have new data component a uh, stream called ERA5, which is useful because it's, it's a reanalysis data. And my final slide is that we are undergoing a major rewrite of our data model code base to be based on ESMF NUOPSI, and this is gonna provide much needed new capabilities in the system. For one thing, we will be able to grid online between the streams and the model, and we'll be able to do many new things like online 3D regridding, conservative regridding, uh, the ability to put together multiple levels and regrid them between two grids that have the same vertical level but different horizontal structure. We're going to have a much simpler description for the data model stream files. Uh, there's going to be new modularity for the science code that is going to be much easier to introduce new streams that have new science dependencies. All of this new CDEPS uh, data model is compatible with CMEPS and the share code that we were creating is going to have interfaces that can be called directly from the model components themselves, as is currently the case with the current data models. And these are all now being placed in a separate repository in our ESCOMP organization called CDEPS. And uh, that's all I have. So uh, I welcome questions and uh, I hope this was not too much to throw at you at once, but I'm very excited about all of these developments. All right, thanks. Thanks very much, Mariana, for that great overview. Um, and there are there are a few questions or comments in the in the chat. So I'll start by reading what's already there and then if others have uh, questions, feel free to either uh, raise your hand via Zoom or, or post your question in the chat and I can read it. Um, Chuck Hakarainen says, uh, has a comment first, I'll read, uh, congratulations on your work developing CMEPS, which I think will be the greatest thing since sliced bread for coupled earth system modeling at numerous spatial and temporal scales across all of the modeling components. Um, Keith. Thank you. <laughs> Keith, I'm not sure. Do you feel like your question has been answered at this point? Keith asked a question about using the um, MCT data type to call share stream data from the prognostic components. And Mariana did address that a bit. Um, well, I'll, I'll kind of ask what I see as a, just a clarification or remaining question of that. Is the implication that the prognostic components that use um, MCT data types and the share stream data will have to have some modifications with, with this new? No. So we have very carefully built this so that it's backwards compatible. So your prognostic components, if they use MCT data types, can still work with MCT data types. Our goal is to encourage you to move to non-MCT data types because it will have many new capabilities that will be advantageous. But we're not telling you either one or the other. So it is backwards compatible with the original MCT share code base because it's in a totally different directory. Uh, frankly speaking, once you convert all of your calls from your inline calls in your component to new, uh, ESMF NUOPSI, we won't have to compile MCT in anymore. But that is something down the road. We want to make sure that this can be done in the least invasive way to scientific development. 
Okay, and Brian, uh, Brian Dobbins asks, I know the MCT functionality had standard init, run, and finalize functions in the component models. Are the Nuopsy model caps similar, or are there more functions to handle the more flexible ordering and timing? I'd love to learn more about this. Uh, um, actually, it is init, run, and finalize. Uh, actually, MCT was adopting this from, this was an ESMF standard that, that actually was set up. But one really powerful thing about Nuopsy is that it does a lot of handshaking between the mediator and the component to say, are you initialized? If not, I'm going to automatically send information back to you until you tell me that you're initialized. So in a sense, even though you still have, you can have multiple initialization phases if that's required. And Nuopsy and CSM will all uh, adapt to it very easily. But it is, in the sense, a bundle of initialized phases or one phase, run phases or one phase, and finalize. OK. Um, Eric Kluzik asks, why is CDEPs separate from CMEPs? Because CDEPs are data models, and CMEPs is a mediator. So if you want community, there is a community that wants to use CMEPs without CDEPs. But my hope is that by putting CDEPs out there and making it really a total bundled entity that can be leveraged by multiple efforts, they can be used without necessarily saying you need CIEM or you need CMEPs. I mean, theoretically, you would need CMEPs to use CDEPs, but you could also think of calling it directly from your code base and then you don't. Okay, and Kevin Rader asks, I saw ESP or DART in some figures, but not others. Does DART need to have a cap written for it? Uh, that is something we have the hooks in place. Um, I think that the DART never had a hook directly in it. It was all through the ESP component in the uh, infrastructure we have in SIEM. So we just have to have the ESP component be CMEPS compliant, and we have not done that yet. But that's, that is something that is planned. And we are very cognizant that this still has to be done. OK. Um, Eric asked another question. Eric, I think in the interest of time, I'm going to go on to other people. Um, and, and your second question is a good one, but we'll, we'll maybe come back to that offline about the details of how streams are done differently. I want to give other people a chance. Let's see. From uh, Rob Jacob asks, have you done any performance comparisons? Uh, initially, yes, we are we are definitely seeing some degradation that we believe we can get rid of. Um, you know, this is the first thing when we put in place, it, we saw quite a bit more. We've eliminated a lot of it. So I think we're seeing something still on the order of 10%, and we need to eliminate that, and I'm very confident we can. Okay, and Negan, I think that was the same question you have, so I'll... Uh, I'll conclude with uh, Tony Craig's question. Um, how do you expect the community will adapt to the requirement that ESMF and Nuopsy be installed on their local system? I don't think that that is going to be a problem. We're going to work really hard to uh, facilitate that to happen and to make it easy to do. Currently, we have other um, externals that need to be installed. And I don't see this as a huge leap to, to insist on that as a requirement given all the benefits that you're going to get. Great. Well, th thank you very much, Mariana, for, for that uh, overview and summary. Um, and uh, so if you could stop uh, sharing your screen. And then uh, next up, we have Alper Altuntas, who is going to be telling us about coupling mom in CESM software challenges and advances. So Alper, if you could share your screen when you're ready. Hello. <clears throat> Can you see my uh, title page? Yes. Great. Yeah, so my name is Alper Altuntash. Uh, I'm a software engineer at the oceanography section, uh, working on coupling MOM6 and CSM. I'm listing here um, uh, oceanography section members working on this project, as well as uh, CSEC engineers that provide us support. So I'll begin with the current state of MOM6 in CSM. Um, it's now fully incorporated in CSM testing and tagging workflow. And uh, we are releasing a functional version in the upcoming CSM 2.2. And I'll note that this won't be 
fully scientifically vetted, but it will be available for uh, those who'd like to experiment with this early version. And um, we will have three component sets available, CMOM, GMOM, BMOM. I'll describe each of these. And uh, we can work with both the uh, legacy driver, MCT, and the new driver that Mariana just described, CMAPS and MOPC. And uh, we have this uh, new grid that we developed for MOM6 within CSM. And uh, this is tripolar two thirds degree grid. We also have some a uh, couple of uh, testing grids. And so here is that uh, hub and spoke architecture that Mariana talked about. And this configuration here is CMOM, where MOM6 is the only active component that gets forced by data atmosphere, data ice, and data runoff. In the case of GMOM, we also have the ice component active. And the BMOM concept is the fully uh, coupled case where all the components are are active except the uh, wave component and the data simulation components. But our near-term plans include adding waves into this uh, configuration as well. And so this diagram shows our uh, uh, MOM6 repository structure within the MOM6 community. So NCAR MOM6 uh, repository, and by the way, each box here is a GitHub repository. And NCAR MOM6 repository is a Git fork of GFDL MOM6. And uh, these uh, repositories are where we have the uh, MOM6 source code and also the caps. And on top of the core repository, we have the MOM interface repository. And this is where we implement the superstructure and uh, CSM specific configurations. And similarly, other MOM6 community members have their own forks, and we synchronize uh, periodically uh, through GitHub pull requests. So here is the timeline of this project. We started about three years ago, and uh, these are some of the major activities and milestones. I'll just mention that we began with the uh, development of the MCT cap, and then uh, we've developed the superstructure called MOM interface. Last year, we've incorporated the NOAPC cap, which was primarily developed by Mariana. And uh, we also developed this uh, MOM RPS module. Uh, this is a Python module within MOM interface. And um, this uh, module allows us to uh, define and create uh, out of the box MOM6 configurations. I'll elaborate on that a little more, but our current uh, uh, task is to finalize our uh, CSM 2.2 configuration. So I'm uh, listing here some of the software challenges that we encountered during this project. Uh, first of all, this has been a collaborative effort across multiple institutions. And so as one would expect, uh, there has been some occasional differences in our convention standards priorities. And another challenge has been that uh, we have been working with actively evolving code bases. MOM6 itself is uh, rapidly evolving. Uh, uh, we get new science, parameterizations, functionalities uh, routinely, and we get about 1.5 commits per year. SIEM is pretty much the same. It also evolves. And another moving part has been this new uh, coupling technology based on MOPC and CMAPS. Uh, one other major challenge I'll mention here is that uh, there has been some implementational discrepancies between the FMS library and CESM. FMS is the uh, underlying library that was uh, developed by GFDL and gets used by MOM6 uh, extensively. It provides functionalities like time manager, domain uh, definitions, diagnostics, input output, uh, model constants, communications, etc. And some of these functionalities overlap with uh, what CSM or SIEM provides. And, and so inevitably, there's some uh, discrepancies that we've encountered between these two that had to be addressed. Uh, another challenge I'll mention is that uh, we lacked flexible and versatile diagnostics and analysis tools. But on the positive side, I'm listing here some of the things that helped us. Uh, first of all, both NCAR CSM and GFDL supports this um, open development mentality. And in particular, GitHub has been uh, very helpful 
in our collaborations and development activities, both internally and externally. And I'll also mention that Mount 6 community is very active and vibrant. For instance, we get uh, weekly meetings with the GFDL and the broader Mount 6 community from around the world where we uh, discuss our development uh, uh, activities and do uh, code reviews, uh, debugging efforts, troubleshootings, etc., on a weekly basis. And um, I'll also mention that CSAG's well-established uh, development workflows and tools have been uh, very instrumental in facilitating uh, our efforts. Just to name a few, CSM testing and tagging workflow and database and the CM infrastructure has been uh, very helpful. So uh, in the light of these uh, challenges and uh, assets that we have, uh, our priorities have been shaped, shaped as follows. Firstly, uh, of course, our first priority is correctness. And we do rigorous testing at every stage of our de development and uh, utilize both CSM and GFDL's Mount 6 testing capabilities. And uh, sometimes uh, we also uh, apply some novel verification techniques when necessary, like the one I show here, where we applied formal methods to verify a fix in the KPP implementation that we incorporated in CSM. Uh, one design approach I'll highlight here is that uh, separation of concerns, which helped us a lot in organizing things. And uh, this is evident in the repository structure that we have at the highest level. A very related uh, concept is modularity. And um, this allowed us to support diverse scientific and practical choices within the uh, same MOM6 code base that's shared by the community. And so uh, as a result of this modular design, we accommodate a diverse set of physics parameterizations, vertical coordinates, and other uh, choices. And actually, this is something that uh, the community, MOM6 community, strives for. And so we, uh, each institution now can implement its own collection of these configurations. And uh, one recent addition to our priorities is optimization. And we are collaborating with Sizzle on this. And I also mentioned that Sizzle is currently exploring uh, uh, the potential of uh, porting MOM6 into GPU systems as well. So uh, I'll briefly go over a uh, development effort that's representative of these challenges that I've just listed. Uh, here, we develop a MOM6 runtime parameter manager in CSM. And the goal here is to define and maintain out-of-the-box configurations of uh, MOM6 within CSM. And to do that, we need to find a common ground between conventional MOM6 approach of defining experiments and that of CSM. And we also need to address some complex inter interdependencies between MOM6 parameters and CSM parameters. And the approach we take is to repurpose some of the conventional MOM6 input parameter files. And uh, uh, we also develop this new uh, module that I've just uh, mentioned, MOMRPS. This is a Python module that generates those uh, MOM6 runtime input files that correspond to our out-of-the-box configurations. It gets invoked by Seam when a user creates a new case and sets up that new case. And um, I don't have time to go into details, but one uh, uh, functionality that I'll just highlight is that this module uh, supports conditionals and formulas that use arbitrary Python expressions in its uh, uh, input file templates. And I'll also note that CSAC is currently exploring to uh, adapt this uh, by other components, CSAM components as well. And uh, so uh, here's an example of an input parameter template definition. The input MOM6 input parameter here is DT term, thermodynamic time step. And this can be set to either 1800 or uh, uh, this uh, value of this formula. And then uh, which one gets chosen depends on these logical constraints that are Python uh, uh, expressions. Similarly, uh, formula is, the, is a Python expression that incorporates these CSM, CSM uh, uh, variables. And let's say for a particular case, our ocean grid is TX0661, coupling base period is day, and we couple 24 times a day. And then the T-term then gets set to 3600 
And this would be our out of the box uh, configuration for this particular case. And if the user happens to change the coupling interval, then uh, this MOM6 parameter also gets updated automatically and will be made sure to be compatible with the rest of the coupled system. And just to summarize. Oh, yeah, one more minute. Sounds like you're wrapping it up. Great. <laughs> so a functional MOM6 release will be an upcoming CSM 3.2. We have this online user manual uh, that's evolving document in uh, MOM6 in CSM. It's in uh, MOM interface repository wiki page. And then we have this uh, ongoing uh, MOM6 webinar, say, webinar series where the uh, MOM6 community members provide tutorials, science talks, and case studies. And then um, here are our ongoing activities. We are working on improving our GMOM and BMOM uh, configurations. And Mike Levy is uh, leading the efforts to incorporate Marble into MOM6. And then uh, uh, we are working on more parameterization related developments. And also a recent addition to our ongoing activities are regional applications and simpler models. And as I mentioned, we're also exploring computational optimization uh, opportunities. And with that, I'll stop. All right, thanks a lot, Alper, for that great overview. Um, if anyone has any questions for Alper, please feel free to raise your hand or post them in the chat. I'll wait a minute or two to see if there's any questions. Okay, there are a couple of questions coming in here. Um, so Rob Jacob asks, what format are these MOM input files? Um, so these are uh, uh, practically key value pairs uh, in a te te text file. And so uh, it's a bit different than nameless files, but uh, some of them also have their uh, more specialized syntaxes and that MOMRPS module allows us to uh, output in those uh, syntaxes. But yeah, it depends on the file. Uh, parameter files are basically key and value pairs, but the diagnostics configuration files are a bit more uh, complex. OK, great. And I see the actually the other chat was just a comment uh, unrelated. So we will, thanks again, Alper. And we'll move on to Jim Edwards, who will be telling us about new workflow capabilities in CESM2. And it looks like, Jim, you're already sharing your screen. Great. On mute, there we go. So you've got my screen, you can hear me? Yep. Welcome, everyone. I'm going to talk a bit about workflow in CESM2. Um, and we do see you're not in full screen. I don't know if you intend to be. Uh, not in full screen? I should be. Oh, sharing is paused. What is this? Let me see if I can. Hmm. How about now? That's good. Yeah, perfect. OK, sorry. Um, OK, my name is Jim Edwards. I'm in the CSM software engineering uh, group. And I'm going to talk about uh, workflow in CSM2. Um, OK, the first, the first thing is uh, to define workflow, because everyone I talk to seems to have a different definition. So I'm just going to give you a really simple definition of workflow, which is the sequence of steps involved in moving from the beginning to the end of some working process. Uh, many CESM workflows are mostly manual processes, which require human intervention at multiple points. The SIEM workflow tools are designed to reduce the human intervention to the extent possible and automate the process and also make it uh, uh, easy to recover if you've lost the process. Um, OK, so uh, there is some workflow control within the case.run script it, itself. And I wanted to mention these, um, these things 
So when you when you submit a, a, a nodes of the system, you can add a pre-run um, data assimilation and post-run scripts to the um, the case dot run itself. Now these are going to use the same resources as the model executable uses. So you either want to make sure that they are very fast, small processes, or that they actually utilize all those resources so that you're not um, um, squandering them. So there's a, a these are XML variables, a pre-run script. So you would point this XML variable to the path of a executable script that would run before the model executable. Um, there is a data assimilation script. Obviously, that's a leading name. Um, you don't have to use it for data assimilation, but that's kind of what was what we had in mind uh, when we put it there. And you can, and so that'll run after the model executable, and you can dictate how many cycles of model executable and data assimilation you're going to run before you uh, complete that and go on to a post-run script, which will run. Uh, before the uh, model exits, the model job exits. Um, then there, there's also the uh, resubmit flag that um, most of you probably know about, and uh, it's an integer flag that tells how many uh, batch system jobs you're going to run in your um, cycles before you before the model stops. And um, when resubmit is greater than zero, the completion of a case run archive cycle will start another case run and archive cycle. Um, and uh, the resubmit flag is, is decremented, continue run is set to true. Um, we have a, a special case where uh, you may not want to set that continue run to true. And so we have another flag to allow for that. And we do that for uh, testing, um, or perhaps uh, data assimilation might use that. Um, some uh, systems, um, in particular, the, the machines at the TAC uh, facility um, do not allow resubmit from compute nodes. And so we have a way to uh, avoid that by using this resubmit immediate flag to case that submit. It'll cause all the jobs to be submitted at one time and use the queuing system to, to uh, implement the um, dependencies between those jobs. So a basic climate model workflow might be to you know, create an experimental case, build the model, run the model, and then archive some model output. Um, and then, and, and all this is in the default CSM2 distribution. This all happens uh, right out of the box. Um, if you add the post-processing tools um, to your, your case, um, then you can also implement the uh, time series generation and um, model diagnostics tools that are available in that post-processing package. Um, so to extend the workflow, so it's not always possible that you want to uh, use all the processes of the um, model in other aspects of the workflow. You might want to use a, a smaller number of processes, a larger number of processes, or maybe even a, a different machine. And so you want different submitted jobs and we allow that through managing uh, this config workflow uh, file. So for example, if you want to add a time series and you have the post-processing uh, tools implemented for your case, you can just add, when you create the new case, you can add the time series workflow and it will, uh, generate code to run that time series script along with your other uh, aspects of the model run. 
Um, so the case control system provides a basic workflow generator. It uses the queuing system, uh, native dependency tools to schedule jobs in a workflow. So that has some limitations. Um, all jobs have to be submitted to queues. Um, there's no clock or calendar support on submission and it's limited to a, a single case. Um, but you can use a uh, preview run to, to view the current workflow. Obviously this, this kind of workflow is, is a little bit limited if you're doing, uh, for example, uh, real-time forecasting. And so we have extended our workflow to allow for, um, I'm sorry, let me back up. We've extended our workflow to allow for uh, external workflow engines such as Silk or uh, EC, EC Flow or uh, Ricotta. Um, we, we've implemented um, a Silk interface and uh, although we haven't implemented interfaces for these other tools, um, it should be pretty easy to do fo so following the template of the Silk interface. Um, the elements of a workflow definition um, specify a job name that could be, you know, uh, some kind of processing step, whatever you're going to call it. Um, and then, uh, so there's a, a template script that would be like a, a batch script that gets filled in for your particular uh, queuing system. It's similar to the templates for uh, case.run or uh, case.sti archive. Um, and so you would see, you, you'd see those, like the, the template for case.run is in the, the default uh, config workflow file that's uh, in the scene now. Um, so you can name dependencies, some other job that has to complete first. So for example, case.st archive depends on the case.run completing. Um, and it, it has to complete with a, uh, with a zero exit code, meaning that there were no errors. So um, we do uh, sometimes run into problems where the model completed, but some other uh, post model process didn't complete correctly. And so that dependency is not uh, fulfilled and the archiving won't run. Um, prereqs, um, so for example, for uh, case.st archive to run, the variable, the XML variable d out s has to be equal to true. So that will be a prereq listed in the config uh, workflow file. And then you can set some runtime parameters in, in here, uh, the task count, the number of tasks per node, and the wall time, if these are different than uh, what the model run uses. If you don't set these, they'll use uh, the model run defaults. Um, so controlling the workflow, the case.submit script does that. If you just run case.submit without any arguments, it's going to submit the end-to-end -end workflow. Um, you can view what that workflow is um, using the preview run script in the case. Um, I mentioned uh, resubmit immediate um, earlier. If you want all of your uh, jobs to be submitted at once and, and wait in the queue, and, and there's more than one reason to do that. I mentioned that you know some systems don't allow submit from compute nodes, that's one reason to do it. Another reason might be that the um, queuing system gives an advantage to jobs that have been waiting in the queue longer, even though they're, they have prerequisites. Um, so some HPC queuing systems will, you know, run your jobs faster if you do this resubmit immediate option rather than the, um, the, the, default resubmit option. Um, you can also submit just a single job of the workflow. So uh, this next line is, is submitting um, the ST archive portion of the job and it'll just run that job without looking to see if it's uh, uh, workflow uh, prerequisites and dependencies have been met. And um, 
but it'll it'll start at that job and continue the workflow. So it'll run case.sd archive and if resubmit is uh, greater than zero, then it will go on to the next run. In some cases, you only want to run a particular job. And so there's an option for that as well. Um, this next line will just do the case.run and ignore any, any jobs that would depend on that job completing. Um, we have tools to create a, an ensemble workflow. Um, so create clone has new options um, to enable ensemble. Uh, so this uh, example of create clone will create eight ensemble members and use the same executable for all eight of those. So you might do this, for example, if you're using uh, CAM's uh, initial condition perturbation, you can use the same executable and just have a, a modified name list uh, for each of the ensemble members. And um, it, it names them just, you know, oops. It, it, it expects a um, digit or digits at the end of the case and will increment that digit or digits to name uh, the subsequent subsequent cases. Um, so you can add, as I mentioned, you can add the Silk workflow engine um, to the case control system. Um, and there's a script in the tools directory called generate Silk workflow. Um, and it translates a case control system workflow to a Silk uh, suite.rc file that you can then uh, ingest with Silk and use to uh, create a more sophisticated workflow. And so it provides support for ensembles where the, the internal uh, workflow only handles a single case. Um, you can customize workflows uh, with all the extensive features of, of Silk. Um, it's got good calendar. Uh, controls. It's got lots of different controls like that to handle these things. And did I just go back? I did, didn't I? Okay. Oh, wait. I'm so confused. Sorry. Um, so here's an example creating a, a Silk workflow from uh, my case 01 that we just had with an ensemble uh, of size eight, and it's going to run 14 cycles. Um, we'll create a silk suite.rc file to set resubmit. This should be actually 14, not eight, and run the ensemble. Okay. So, yeah, that'll do that. Jim, about one more minute. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So we've had uh, several experiments uh, using these tools. I'll mention a few of them. Uh, interglacial land ice experiment. Um, they were doing 10 year model runs after which they were adjusting the topography sent to the atmosphere um, based on new uh, land ice. Uh, and they've run this uh, for something like 7,500 years now um, with, this, with this workflow. Um, the NOAA's MR weather app uh, came out of the box with a workflow that includes the change res to uh, uh, modify initial conditions for the FE3 die core. And um, yeah, they're, they've been pretty pleased with it, I think. Uh, the CSM2 large ensemble experiment is running at ICCP CCP in South Korea. Um, and we're running a 100 member ensemble from 1850 to 2100. It kind of looks like this. Um, we're archiving history and generating time series. Globe is transferring them back to NCAR to post process. And then we have subseasonal to seasonal prediction using CSM and Silk. Um, this is something that we're trying to expand and make more general. And you can learn about SEAM here. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Jim, for that. Um, I will, uh, let's see, I think there's a couple of
questions already in the chat. So I'll start with that. Well, first as a comment, just following on from your final slide, Cecile Hane also says uh, that she has used this ensemble workflow option and really likes it. So there, there's a testament from a user. There you go. Um, Francis Vitt asks, how is case.submit dash dash job different than dash dash only job? So case.submit dash dash job will start your workflow with the given job and continue the workflow from that point. Um, dash dash only job will only run that particular piece of the workflow and then stop. Uh, Minju asks, is, is the ensemble the same as the multiple instance feature of Seam? And if not, what are the differences? Okay, the, the ensemble is not the same as the multiple instance feature of Seam. The multiple instance feature of Seam creates a single executable with multiple instances of the component models, including now the coupler. Um, so that will all run in one batch job where the ensemble uh, feature has a separate batch job for each model run. And which, uh, which method you use uh, depends a little bit on you know, what kind of experiment you're doing. Um, the uh, multiple instance feature is a little more restrictive about how you can change what's happening between one instance and another. Um, than the ensemble and also getting through the queuing system may depend on how many tasks you're using in a given job. All right. Um, I think, all right. Uh, I'll give people another 30 seconds to chime up if they have any, any other question. Uh, but yeah, thanks a lot, Jim. Um, All right, we'll move, move along. Um, next up will be Carl Drews, uh, who will be telling us about uh, fast access of irregular grids and meshes by latitude and longitude. So Carl, go ahead when you're ready. Hi, I'm Carl Drews, and I want to check to see if you can see my opening screen here. Yes, we see the CESM regionally refined grid. Excellent. So a couple of weeks ago, actually about a month ago, I was given an assignment by Simone Tilms to take the output of CESM regionally refined grid and map it to EPA stations. So I hadn't seen the grid before and I decided to plot all the points. The points are in columns, all the data is in columns. And over CONUS, it looked um, like the, the image on the left here and over uh, zoomed in on Colorado. And I found that it wasn't quite what I expected. It was in these three by three grid cells or three by three clusters. And I've since learned that, that's, that those are the spectral elements. So I found this to be fascinating and looked at it larger. And, and you can see here on the left-hand side, this is zoomed in over CONUS. And then these um, clusters, they rotate and expand outwards and achieve a coarser resolution farther away from the continental United States. So um, I have some numbers here on the right in the CSM uh, regional refined um, model that I'm using, it has 174,000 grid points and it expands out this way. The rows and columns over CONUS are kind of latitudes and longitudes, but as you can see, they rotate over Africa. So they're kind of the latitude and longitudes are almost kind of reversed. So this is kind of the idea of how, to, how, how can I approach this? And of course, I know this is for computation across scales. Um, so this is what I had to look with. And I don't know if anybody, if you've all looked at this very closely, but this is what it looks like when you plot it out. So here's the problem as Simone presented to me, we have a thousand EPA stations. We wanna look up the value of CESM at all those a thousand points to a comparison. Plot it as a scatter plot, which you see on the right hand side here. And if all the points are clustered along the diagonal, then we know we have good um, agreement. Uh, she wanted to do this efficiently and she remarked that she had written some IDL code that goes and compares, looks up every EPA station with all 174K points. And of course she recognized that that was inefficient and so she called in the computer scientists. So the baseline algorithm is to look up all P EPA stations across N CESM grid points. Just find the closest one and report that. So that would be a, an algorithm on the order of P times N. That's the baseline. 
Now, this is something we're going to, even if we don't do regridding, as Mariana mentioned, this is something we're going to do a lot. We're going to have flight tracks, curtain plots, all sorts of things. We're going to be accessing these things by latitude and longitude because that's a natural way to do this. So we certainly want something more efficient than that. And I came up with an, um, so, so that's, sorry. So the baseline performance is order P times N, and I measured that, I programmed that in Python, and I found that it takes 152 seconds to look, do all these lookups and generate a plot there. Each operation there requires a hypotenuse calculation because you're doing from one point to another and a cosine because the meridians um, converge toward the poles. So you have to adjust for that effect. So I suspect other UCAR staff are working on this, notably um, Patrick Callahan and Forrest Lacey, who were in on an earlier meeting that I had, and they mentioned that they had worked problem. So here is the fast access algorithm that I came up with and how fast it is. The order is n log n plus p. So since there's a plus sign in the middle of that expression, you know that there's going to be two phases. And you're correct. The first phase, the n log n, is a load phase. And then there's a lookup phase. So for this particular EPA problem, load time 3.7 seconds, lookup time was um, less than a tenth of a second. So depending on what you want to count here, overall, the speed up is 40x. If you have just the lookup only, the speed up is 1500x. So in other words, if you want to say we're going to load it, do just three point seconds of load, and then do a bunch of lookups, let's say the thousands of plots that I produce daily, you're going to be approaching something like a 1500 factor of speed up. So that's good. The algorithm works by taking all these points, all 174,000 points, and really ignoring all the structure to them, ignoring all the regularity that is there. They're just random points thrown onto the globe, just all over the place. And the first thing that is done is it sorts all these points into latitude bands. So there's these bins here. We have west east bands by latitude here. So this, these yellow marks are a picture of the Earth, the globe here. Second step, once you have them in latitude bands, you're going to put them in longitudinal stripes. So you're setting up an artificial grid by latitude and longitude, and you're putting all the points into these grid cells. Now I have a sparseness factor because I don't want them to end up um, all clustered in a certain place. Um, but even as you can see, so we're going to expect some, like, like see this four, eight, and five here, that's conus. We expect light, large density there. You see this zero, one, zero down in the lowest row. That's going to be over the Southern Ocean where there's not many points. As it turns out, the maximum of points in any one cell turned out to be nine. And I recognize that as the three by three cluster. So in all this uh, mapping, I have captured one cluster in one of my grid cells. So anytime you have a new algorithm, you want to look at the diagnostics and make sure it is doing what you think it's doing. So I plotted the density of points, namely the number of points in any latitude band. And as you can see, it's high over CONUS, which is good because um, let's say Brownsville or Key West somewhere starts around 25 south and then the United States goes to about 49 north and then the points tail. But I expect, you just want to check this kind of thing. There's some stuff going on on the equator that I don't really understand. So I don't really know what that's about. But anyway, this is sort of the look at the density of points by latitude for this algorithm. Within a single grid cell, remember I've got all the regionally refined points in my single grid cells, you have to search. Like let's suppose A is an EPA station and we're looking for the closest point in CESM. We're going to search outward in, in these squares by a certain radius until we find another point. Since all the points are, you know, fall within some grid cell, you only need to know the nearest point, the nearest portion of that square and if that is outside, let's say this blue circle here, then you know that nothing in there can be closer. So in this case, we have an illustration. We start at A, we're looking at B. These circles are not exactly um, centered on a vertex because A is not on a vertex. So this is, this is the way you're looking at it. And there's a, like I mentioned, there's a sparseness factor that spreads everything out. So you're looking at these things. Um, so you have to search on the order of maybe 10, 20 cells instead of 174,000, which is a big advantage. So I also want to test my algorithm, and I found that the maximum search radius, the maximum distance from an EPA station to a CESM point, was radius 4. 
And I said, that must be a mistake. That's too far. Looked it up, and sure enough, it's a mistake. It's out in the Northwest Territories. That can't be right. There's nothing there. There's no city. There's no nothing until I turn on the satellite view. And sure enough, there's a dam, and there's a building. And somewhere in that building, people are measuring quantities and reporting them to us. And okay, so the point here is that the accuracy decreases outside of CONUS, as you expect. In other words, it's farther from a, a lookout point to where you find the nearest CSM point, but the algorithm still works. That's as we expect. When you go way out north or away from the grid, it you get you have to get farther away. So in terms of software engineering, this algorithm is coded in about 600 lines of Python code, and I made it as a Python module. And we have unit tests and diagnostics there. Uh, for the future, here we are at a workshop. I propose and suggest that we create a standard Python module for handling, handling these kind of grids, just like the Python wharf module. There's something in there called interp level, which I found very useful. So let's make something like that and perhaps add it to the ESMF framework um, somewhere else. But let's use this thing so every person who encounters the same problem doesn't have to spend two or three days working through how to solve it. So this is, like I said, this is not really a regritter, but it's, it's a lookup thing, a fast lookup. So we'd all like to speed up code. There's a lot of applications for this and um, just beyond um, post-processing and plotting, but a lot of lookups and comparisons. I make, uh, like I said, thousands of plots per day. So I'm really interested in a speed up factor of 40 times to 1500 and I'm going to close with sort of the look at the parameters we have here. Um, the range is the full globe, as mentioned. The, there's an aspect ratio, and I did my sparseness factor. The latitude stride turns out to be three tenths of a degree. And if you increase the sparseness factor, you'd increase that. And perhaps there's a way to tune this, but I just picked two and just saw that. So this is the parameters here. And at that, I can open it up to any questions. Hey, thank you very much, Carl, for uh, for presenting that to us. Um, there are a lot of questions already pouring in, so let me uh, let me start with what's here, and others should feel free to to chime in with additional questions. Um, Chuck Hackerinen asks, "Is the geographically closest grid point the best choice? Are you investigating other techniques that take into account the modeling values for the EPA relevant parameters? For example, an EPA station in Chicago might be physically closest to a model grid point over Lake Michigan." but a grid point further west over land might be more appropriate. Oh, so the answer is Simone recognized um, that, she, so she specified the closest point. So that's the algorithm I'm following. I didn't think about land or um, sea points. What I thought mostly about was the bilateral um, interpolation. So if So in expanding this, I would have gone towards something like um, find the nearest enclosing quadrilateral and interpolate across that. Uh, I didn't think about the um, land C section. So that could that would be an improvement here. Mm -hmm. Brian Kaufman asks, uh, would ESMF's nearest neighbor map be able to be used in this context? Uh, maybe, I'm not familiar with that. So um, like I said, that, that's why I write a workshop here. And so um, it may have similar tools and obviously it does regridding. So that's um, something related. Okay, and uh, Jeff Anderson uh, comments, this is a subproblem of what we have to do for data assimilation in DART or any other system. We have a number of tools that perform similar operations and are based on quad tree searches that are similar to your ideas. We actually do much more than finding just the closest point. We find a set of neighbors and then interpolate in various ways. Also, we have algorithms that have been optimized for doing this with the SE grid and make explicit use of the geometry. So our much faster than uh, much faster techniques. So, um, so other, other okay. points to share? That doesn't surprise me. This is a pretty common problem. This one is implemented in Python, which is my language of choice for science and web work. Um, Adam Harrington, I think I think that's who A. Herring is, uh, asks, uh, can, you, can you think of how to extend this method to compute zonal means using your sorting method? This is relevant to data storage because regridding to a high resolution global grid dictated by the smallest DX in the refined region leads to massive files that are untenable. Um, 
for for zonal, I think since I have latitude bands, I think that's what I would use or sort of go across and gather everything in that stripe. Now, if it's a meridional section, then I would gather the vertical ones because they're all aligned as well. Okay, great. Um, and Steve Goldhaber asks, how does this compare to using the built-in latitude and longitude and closest point history features or CAM SE? Uh, I don't know. Uh, of of can se yeah and steve if you want to unmute yourself and clarify anything feel free to do so i thought i couldn't unmute myself um so that's uh, when you did these regional refined uh runs are using cam se the spectral element so uh you can just specify output fields to be uh the closest points to a, you give it a collection of points and you say, I want, I want the output from the closest point to this. And it will actually just write that output as part of the uh, history mechanism. Also, you can output to a lat long grid. Uh, although I think Adam was indicating that if you use the high resolution, uh, you end up with a large lat long grid, which we don't want to do because you end up with like this high resolution lat long output over Africa that you're not interested in or, you know, the middle of the Pacific or something. Yeah, I think so. I think the answer is here that um, if if you have a uniform grid, um, like you just pointed out over Africa, it's um, it's it, you still get a coarseness to it, and you really want the fine control over conus. So you really don't want to map the entire globe to a uniform grid. Well, for the for the um, closest point uh, algorithm, though, that actually does do the uh, spherical distance algorithm in parallel to find the point that's closest to each of the indicated stations and just okay. outputs just those. Oh, I see. Okay. The, 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 yeah, so I just was wondering if anybody looked at that. The problem is you have to think about it before you do the run, whereas your tool works after the fact, which means you can access data files. Just something to think about. Okay, thank you. Um, and then Minshu asks or says, this is very useful. Does the grid have to be RR or, or can it be any other unstructured grid? Um, any unstructured grid. I've done storm surge modeling. And what people do is they put a bunch of points in New York Harbor and, and all the channels there in the East River. Then out in the Atlantic Ocean, it gets really sparse because it's deep. Um, and, and it's just like totally put where we feel like putting points. This will work fine for that. OK, and then Koichi asks, where can we find this Python module? <laughs> It's on right now. It's just me, and so it's on Subversion. But I want to um, put this under GitHub, where it'll be. It'll start to be a more of a community accessible project. Yeah. So this is something I'll just chime in with a with a comment for related to this and, and more broadly. I mean, I think you know we've we've had discussion in a number of subgroups about about kind of making repositories for uh, post processing in CESM as a whole or individual components. And I know. Um, the land modeling group, which I'm most involved with, has, has started a, a GitHub repository mm -hmm. for post-processing scripts for the land model CTSM. Um, I know there's a lot of work on the in, uh, for Matt Long and others to to come up with kind of tools for, that can be used for this. But yeah, this is maybe something where we where we could use some more uh, more coordination, and and I think that would be useful for a number of us to talk about and come up with a plan for um, for how, where to host these useful post-process general purpose post-processing scripts. So thanks for raising that uh, point of discussion. Sure. All right. Uh, well, thanks for that again. And uh, for the last talk before the break, uh, Rob Jacob uh, will be letting us know about some of the software engineering efforts going on in E3SM. OK. Um, let me share my screen here. All right, everyone can see that, I assume. Wait for yes. a slide. Okay. All right, so I'm going to give it's a. Not, it's not in full screen, though, Rob. Oh, hang on. Great. Are you seeing the preview? Or are you seeing the actual screen? We're seeing, no, we're, no, we're seeing the, the slide itself, the full, okay. full slide. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, all right. Uh, so I'm going to uh, give a quick update on many things that are happening in uh, in uh, E3SM software engineering land. Uh, 
first of all, well, infrastructure group um, that I run in E3SM also uh, does handles data and all the model output. So we've so far published about 17 of our deck simulations um, from the water cycle and our biogeochemistry uh, cases. Uh, monthly output has been published for all, uh, and we're working on the high frequency output, the H1 through H4 files. Um, and uh, we continue to find various errors in some of the files, mostly from, uh, there was a problem in the CMIP conversion, or, uh, or maybe some of the actual data was corrupted. Uh, we've been uh, documenting and updating uh, tools and scripts to help automate all of this, uh, extracting our archives, staging, batching app files, validating the CMIP conversion, and publishing. Uh, we've also established a backup uh, repo at Livermore uh, to hold all the data on disk uh, for us. Yeah. Um, we are uh, now building uh, E3SM with CMake. Uh, this was a process started last year by uh, Jim Fukar. Uh, what happens is case setup uh, now builds uh, info needed for CMake. And then case build calls the CMake generated make files that's in the scene case control system. So CMake doesn't handle all the logic in the, in the giant Perl scripts um, uh, that are in behind the atmosphere and the land. Uh, th those still need to be converted to Python at some point. But CMake building is now the default within uh, E3SM. So uh, this group also um, uh, maintains uh, several uh, diagnostics and other packages. Um, E3SM Diags is our tool for doing uh, most of our uh, atmospheric model analysis. And um, uh, we've been adding a couple of components for ENSO um, and also adding a QBO analysis and some new observational data sets to uh, compare against as well. Uh, E3SM supports the uh, development of NCO uh, along with other agencies. And um, uh, I know these tools are, are uh, well known to uh, people who work with uh, this ESM data. Um, they've uh, finalized and released improvements to subgrid scale regridding. Uh, this is for if you have a land model file with data on, by vegetation type or land, plant functional type, um, it can uh, map those to a, to a grid for. Uh, for visualization and analysis. And there's some new map quality checking tools. These are checking the uh, offline maps that are generated by tools like uh, ESMF or uh, Tempest Remap and uh, making sure that they are uh, correct. Um, also some spatial mean options for the uh, NC Climo time series splitter. And they're starting to work on porting compute heavy parts of NCO to a GPU if that's available. So another tool that we've developed um, is uh, called Zstash. And what this does is it kind of sits between the short-term archive and the long-term archive. As many of you may know, when you want to put a bunch of data on a tape system, it likes to have single giant files, not uh, lots of little files, like individual monthly history files. So we've uh, created a tool that systematically uh, tars up all of the files from, uh, that might be in a short-term archive and uh, it creates a database of them uh, with uh, MD5 checksums so that you can tell when you extract them again that uh, the data hasn't been uh, corrupted. And we're standardizing to use this tool across all the simulation groups uh, so that no matter who's doing a production simulation, uh, they're all using this. And uh, a, a little helper feature to this um, a program is a data stager script that will uh, take things from a local HPSS archive extract them, and then transfer it via Globus to an endpoint if you want to do analysis on some other system. So uh, looking now at the main model repository uh, and changes uh, in the past year, uh, we've added some ex more external submodules. We use Git submodules a lot in E3SM. Uh, COSP2, the uh, cloud simulator, is now a submodule tracking the development uh, of the uh, main simulator in the CF MIP. Uh, GitHub project. Uh, CVMix and Ocean BGC and MPAS are now submodules. Now MPAS is, is itself a submodule in E3SM, so E3SM now has recursive submodules. Uh, it makes the code though, it makes the code for these pieces more visible and removes a fragile part of the build system. Uh, and but you can still clone the source uh, with a single command. Uh, it's just that dash dash recursive, uh, which we were already telling people to do um, just to get the normal submodules. 
And uh, when you update your submodules, you also have to add this cursive command. Uh, we have several maintenance branches in our code that are long lived and kind of capture uh, states of the model uh, that we want to keep using uh, by updating config files and things like that. Uh, and some of those maintenance branches had additional comp sets and other things on them that weren't in master. So we fixed that and merged those all those back to master. Um, the uh, multi-scale modeling framework convection option, which I'll talk about more later, was being developed on its own fork. We've brought that back to master and so all further development will continue there. And there's a main 1.2 branch for the cryosphere ones, which is going to have uh, one more thing added to it, I think. And they're gonna have to, and they're gonna redo some of the cryosphere runs on that. We've also added some new test suites. We have uh, uh, four uh, biogeochemistry cases uh, running nightly on the main one one branch. And we've added tests for one of the good creation, grid creation tools that are in SIEM. And uh, that's part of the SIEM test suite. So, and uh, within the main model, uh, the development, V2 we thought was gonna be minor changes compared to V1, but uh, that didn't really happen. Uh, one of the big changes is that we're moving to a tri-grid configuration. Uh, so the land and river components are now on a single half degree grid, most basically the river grid. Um, that means we have to make uh, new atmosphere to land maps. That's no longer just a copy operation, it's actually uh, interpolation. Um, this enables closer coupling between the land and river uh, hydrologic cycles, especially for water management and irrigation. And you now have three grids in the, uh, um, in the main system. And this is a capability that the uh, CPL7 MCT coupler driver already had uh, from long ago because uh, CESM looked at it, um, I think when they were first experimenting with the SE um, die core. And so we've kind of we've kind of revived that and reusing it a lot. And then within the uh, die core uh, V3SM, uh, we're switching to a non-hydrostatic option, and we're also using a uh, semi-Lagrangian tracer transport. And then uh, finally, one of the other big changes is that we're going to be calculating the physics instead of at the same points as the dynamics. It's on a uh, finite volume grid, which has a slightly reduced number of points. And that's illustrated in the figure on the uh, on the lower right here. Uh, the uh, the orange po the uh, green points are the uh, spectral element points um, of the mesh, and then the little red circles are the uh, finite volume type points within that within that square. And um, this is to get rid of some grid imprinting that we were seeing in the uh, in the physics when it's done on that mesh. And this has also been seen by Peter Lorenzen, and he also has a, a similar fix for the uh, for the SE mesh. And then there's some uh, we also are experimenting with our regionally refined meshes, not only in the atmosphere, but also in the ocean and the sea ice. Uh, the upper right there shows uh, one of the uh, grids around North America. And I think we now have a version of that where the grid extends all the way across the Arctic, the fine part. Um, and, uh, and then there's some other uh, improvements to the atmospheric physics. But this is the same computational approach V2. It's still Fortran with MPI and OpenMP. Uh, it's scheduled for release September of next year. The feature freeze was actually July of last year, and we've been um, just kind of uh, tuning it and testing it and testing all these new features since then. So uh, the MOAB-based coupler that I've mentioned before, um, we have had a lot of effort in the past year directed to an offline uh, tool that's built with that called MB Tempest. This takes the Tempest remap capabilities for calculating uh, area weights in, uh, and combines them with MOAB's data parallel um, abilities and uh, its intersection schemes. Um, uh, and one of the things we had to do was introduce a new intersection algorithm for meshes with holes. Moab had this advancing front algorithm and it had problems if a mesh had a hole in it, like for example, the ocean mesh. There are holes where there's a land mass. There's just no mesh there. And so when you're trying to calculate the intersection between that and the atmosphere mesh, um, uh, you can miss parts. And uh, then we were taking this tool and applying it to a very uh, uh, hard problem of generating a map between this Hydro 1K mesh, which is a 10 minute mesh, and the NE1024 grid, which is a three kilometer grid. And what we found when we looked at it closely, and Charlie Zender found this as well, was uh, that this mesh is really bad. <laughs> uh, this is like some part over Siberia. And you can see that there's parts of the globe where there are no mesh, and there's parts of the globe where the mesh overlaps. And that's very bad for, uh, for doing area weight calculations. Basically, you have to just correct the weights afterwards to uh, fix that. Um, 
And uh, we were able to get Moab coupler to send from two different atmospheric grids, but now we have to uh, kind of uh, redo that work because with the introduction of the uh, physics grid and the tri-grid, all of the coupling occurs only on the physics grid, only on that finite volume physics grid. So the spectral element grid isn't really involved in the coupling anymore. Uh, so let's oh, uh, uh, about another yeah. minute or so, brother. Okay, um, I'll skip this and go to the uh, architecture roadmap. Uh, what's coming down the line in DOE is uh, um, oops, uh, several GPU systems, basically. Um, Perlmutter phase one is gonna be the first one. That uh, has AMD chips with NVIDIA. Uh, then uh, Argon is getting uh, an Intel system with Intel GPUs. And shortly after that, Frontier is getting an AMD system with AMD Radeon GPUs. And these are, will be the first exascale systems in the US. Um, and what you can see here is first of all, for exascale, at least for the first version, uh, everything is GPU. And there's at least three different flavors of GPU. So uh, what we're dealing doing uh, to handle this is um, we're uh, looking at a couple of different approaches for programming portability. Uh, first one is to use Fortran with OpenMP 4.5 or 5.0. 4.5 has GPU target offload capability. Uh, you might be familiar with OpenMP as a way to program threads on a CPU, but you can also use it to target a GPU. And then another approach is uh, C++ and Cocos. Uh, so C++, Cocos is a template programming model that has a back end for various uh, uh, GPUs. And there are similar approaches to this and it uses a template programming model in C++ to uh, make this happen. So uh, we're doing this in a couple of different uh, approaches. Um, the first one is applying C++ Cocos and just making an entirely new atmosphere model. And this is the screen project. Uh, and it's already done pieces of the atmosphere such as the dynamics and radiation, and um, I believe the boundary scheme, no, the microphysics. Uh, next up is the boundary scheme. And then there's a second thread of development, which is pursuing the Fortran and OpenMP approach for a super parameterized atmosphere. Here, the idea is you run the super parameterized atmosphere on the GPU, that makes use of that power, and you get the benefit of the super parameterization on your, uh, on your simulation. And, uh, and then in uh, the MPAS components, we are uh, also doing a Fortran and a uh, uh, OpenMP approach. So uh, that's it. And I'm happy to take questions. All right, thanks a lot, Rob, for letting us know about all that. Um, so let's see, there's one question from Jeff Anderson in the chat. Uh, will your SE core change to the new vertical coordinate uh, I can't quite understand this question. Will your SE core change to the new vertical coordinate, something that is in the CESM2 SE core? Maybe uh, that, I, that I could try to translate, yeah. yeah. That, that, that We're using a dry, uh, dry vertical coordinate. I think that's what he's talking about, maybe? Oh, um, we're translating to, uh, we are translating to a vertical coordinate called theta. Uh, but I can't remember if that's the same or not. No, no, that's a, that's a different, uh, a different innovation, so. Mm. So no, I, I don't believe. believe. Yeah. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions right now. I, I have a I have a question um, about the the possible C plus plus translation. How much? So is it just? Would it just be the atmosphere? Would it, would it be like the entire atmosphere? How much of the code base would be retranslated into C plus plus? Well, um, uh, all of all of the. Uh, all of the guts of the physics and the dynamics uh, for the physics pieces they've chosen. Now they're using uh, shock for uh, turbulence and P3 for microphysics, and there won't be a convection scheme initially because initially, they're doing high res, non hydrostatic. Uh, and then uh, they weren't going to do the radiation, but then, then somebody went and did RRT and GP anyway <laughs> in C. So that will all be C, and there's a C like atmospheric driver code as well. Um, uh, some of the things that are Fortran, we don't know what to do about the history system. <laughs> uh, CAN has a lot of features in its, and, and EAM have a lot of history features in its history system, and we're not quite uh, we're not quite going away of rewriting all of that. And um, I think there are there are various parts of the of the dynamics driver that are still Fortran. I think. Okay. 
but nothing nothing compute intensive. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're going to take a break for well close to fifteen minutes now. Uh, we'll we'll reconvene at uh, two forty five Mountain Time, um, where we'll hear from Gary Strand and then have a discussion on model output for CESM three. So, um, yeah. See you back all back here in about well twelve minutes now.
All right, so welcome back. Um, and uh, Gary, are you yep. on now? Okay, so for this second half, uh, we will, uh, the second half of the meeting this afternoon is gonna be focused on model output. And uh, Gary Strand will get this started with a short talk on determining best practices for archiving and reproducibility for computational model output. Um, and then we'll follow from that into a large discussion for the rest of the meeting on uh, on managing model output for CESM3. So Gary, when you are ready, go ahead and share your screen and go ahead. All right. How does that look? Great. All right. So uh, thanks, Bill, and, and thanks to uh, the software uh, engineering group to let me uh, invite me to talk today. Um, I'm Gary Strand, I'm the, uh, the CSM data manager, and I'm gonna talk about a new-ish new project from EarthCube, which is called, uh, uh, led by Gretchen Belindor, uh, Matt Miernick of the NCAR Library, and Doug Schuster, of the, uh, who's the head of the uh, CISO Research Data Archive here at NCAR, uh, talking about how to, best practices for archiving and reproducibility of model data. And if you're not familiar with EarthCube, it's a uh, NSF-funded um, project, a, a partnership between uh, GEO and the Division of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure to um, transform geoscience research by developing cyber infrastructure to improve access sharing, visualization, and analysis of all forms of geosciences data and related resources. Um, it's kind of bottom-up community-driven. So. Um, they're very much interested in helping us uh, how, you know, how we can manage all these many petabytes of data that we have. So uh, we're seeking out, or they're seeking out, and I'm, I'm on the steering committee among many others. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so this is a talk that Gretchen gave at AMS back in uh, January, which seems like a different reality compared to now. But um, so what we're trying to, try to do is, um, get as much community collaboration on this as we possibly can. And there will be a workshop coming up, a second workshop coming up in August. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So obviously, you know, what's the problem? What's the plan to tackle this problem? And how, you, how can you participate? So in the atmospheric sciences, we've been somewhat ahead of other communities in acknowledging the need for, you know, good data management. I mean, we've always been um, into big data. We've got, uh, tons and tons and tons of data, as everybody knows. Uh, obviously, we need to maintain our the observations that we use for comparison uh, permanently. Uh, we have many, many users that, that we share our data with. Um, the climate data portal, uh, climate data gateway here at NCAR has roughly 50,000 user accounts of which 700 have just been uh, registered just this year so far. So we're getting you know, several a day, dozens a week. And obviously that, you know, for sharing across all these things, we need to uh, come up with good data standards and of which there are many to choose from. And of course, uh, push for open access and reproducibility. And of course, this has led to requirements from our funding agencies and publishers and others to actually implement all this stuff. So from the AGU publications, here are their requirements for uh, the data that we uh, create. So um, all data necessary to understand and so forth, um, new protocols or methods used to generate the, the uh, data in the paper, uh, any uh, software or code, and as well as derived data products reported or described in a paper. And that's uh, fairly daunting because even though we've done this kind of thing before to some extent, we've never had a requirement uh, from publishers to do this except just recently 
I mean, the old, uh, you know, contact the author for access to the data was the old tried and true way of doing things, and that's no longer acceptable. And I've had a few of our uh, scientists come to me saying, I put that on my paper, the reviewer said, no, I can't do that anymore, so help, I need to get something going on this. So the AGU advice is keep all the data. AMS, however, has uh, a different set of guidelines here. Um, so they all they require is that your data are, are, are archived and cited properly and so forth. And so they follow, they ask, do what FAIR says. And what FAIR is, is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. So here's a couple of examples of uh, FAIR causing issues. Um, basically, the upshot is AMS says, uh, keep some or all the data and ask someone else to do that for you. The journals won't archive our data for us. The, uh, Funding agencies will, you know, ask for, or you know, they'll they'll provide some funding for archives, but we, we don't have a, uh, you know, NSF master archive for all of the uh, science that NSF funds. And uh, as always, you know, typically we have so much more data than what's actually shown in a, in a paper. That you know, maintaining and, and, and keeping all this stuff is a, a non-trivial task. So what to do about model data? Well, we know the answer is not save all the data. That's simply not, not tenable any longer. Uh, we currently have roughly 20 petabytes, yes, that's 20,000 terabytes of archive model output on our, our tape archive system. And one of my big tasks over the next uh, 16 months or so, or however it is until October of 2021 when it goes away, you know, how do, what do we save of that old stuff uh, onto our current archive system, which is not on tape, uh, taking into account the fact that we have a brand new model here that we want to do all sorts of interesting experiments with, you know, large ensembles, CMIP6 being an ex a, uh, another example and so forth. So how do we balance, you know, this old data, the new data, and in, in light of these publishing requir pub requirements from publishers and funders? So what do we do? Well, the whole project, uh, the whole point of this uh, RCN or this project, is to bring a diverse group of modeling experts to come up with ways to uh, help determine, you know, what data to save and for how long and exactly how do we do that. And then, once we figure those things out, how do we uh, disseminate those into the uh, wider modeling community, not just uh, climate modeling but other uh, modeling activities, so that you know everybody can do do the best thing that they possibly can. So one of the uh, one thing that's we've started with is these uh, a ranking rubric. So um, if you go down the on the columns uh, on the uh, left is model descriptor, which has certain categories, and then rank one, rank two, and rank three will give us an idea of you know where do these uh, where do we go between saving all the output or saving a bunch of the output versus just saving the setup. And you know, for CSM2 specifically, I mean, it's a use across many research disciplines. It's difficult to reproduce. And uh, it has high computational costs and it requires you know, either you know, like Cheyenne or, or Cori or Summit or one of these you know, HPC systems. So we tend to save more output than saving the setup. However, for other modeling groups or modeling, other modeling communities, it may be more important to just save the initial conditions and this, and this code and so forth, because it's relatively easy to regenerate the data. And that is not always the case with us. And then, of course, there's other aspects of, for example, reproducibility. You know, is it really bit for bit reproducibility, or is it, um, you know, statistical similarity reproducibility? Um, in the old days, we used to, I used to think that as uh, a model became obsolete and then, you know, as the data that it generated aged, it got older and older, it would be less interesting, therefore not needed to be kept. But actually, people are now interested in, in analyzing these generations of, of uh, our climate models to see how they uh, improved in performance over time. So, in fact, you know, we have data from CCSM3 that is still actively being used, believe it or not even though a lot of that data is more than 10 or 15 years old. And of course, the storage costs come into play. Uh, the current um, cost for 
uh, data hosted by the research data archive is $45 per terabyte per year of storage. So if you've got a lot of terabytes, it'll add up to a considerable cost. So uh, the next thing that the, the, uh, this project is going to be undertaking is some use case, use case examples, uh, idealized parameterization studies. Some groups do that. Uh, CMIP, a climate model intercomparison project, we do that, of course, and, and various other ensemble modeling systems and so forth. And uh, each of these different kinds of, of models have different uh, needs in terms of how they, how they generate and how they need to keep their data. So hopefully with the, the next workshop that's coming up in August, uh, we'll be able to flesh out some of these and get some really good ideas on how do we, how do, we uh, do all this stuff. And so the uh, first workshop was back in May. The travel obviously became a moot point. And um, I, uh, I and a, a number of others participated in the first workshop back in May, and that was, that was it turned out really well. We got some really good material out of that. And uh, so what we're looking for, I'm sorry, is inclusion of advanced uh, grad students and early career scientists to give us, uh, you know, old guys like me have a lot of ideas about how we best do this, but I'm always interested in hearing uh, new ideas because uh, I have some experience with this stuff, but I don't know everything, of course. And I'm always interested to hear what other people have to say. And maybe someone's got some really good, interesting ideas that uh, will help us uh, get around the uh, problems caused by all this data that we have. And so uh, Gretchen, uh, Matt, and Doug, and myself will be giving talks at these various, uh, in these various venues. Um, the goal is always to provide a best practices uh, document to the community. We will not solve all of our model archiving, but we'll provide a, a common framework. So at least we have you know, a baseline of comparison and a baseline language that we can all talk to each other and understand what's going on. And the steering committee has a, a good group of people. Um, Gokhan, uh, the CSMT scientist, is also on the steering committee. And we've also got a couple of really excellent students that have some really fantastic ideas. But I'm, I'm very excited that they're, that they're participating. And uh, just my last slide, if you're interested uh, in a workshop invitation, please email Doug and why you're interested in participating and your background. Uh, there is the um, GitHub location for the, all of the documentation and the, uh, the about and so forth that, that the uh, project has. And uh, thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thanks a lot, Gary. Um, so yeah, we'll, we can take some questions if you have questions specific to Gary's uh, presentation. Of course, we'll have a long time to discuss model output this afternoon, but if there's questions specific for, for this, for Gary in this presentation, uh, please go ahead, either raise your hand in the participant window or ask something via the chat. Um, let's see, Gunter Legui asks, could you repeat the cost per terabyte per year? That's, uh that's for, I would consider that kind of like Cadillac level service. That's if you want your data hosted by the Research Data Archive, which is a, you know, they, they primarily focus on observational data, but uh, they, they will host data for us. But at $45, $45 per terabyte per year, that gets to be very expensive. Um, CSM, uh, my job is to, to manage all this stuff and, and CSM kind of absorbs that cost internally. So we don't have to pay that really. All right. So um, yeah. So we're gonna we're gonna move on to uh, a a big discussion now, um, led by Sherry, Gary, Jim, and Jesse. Um, and just a couple of points there. Uh, so feel free to continue to use the um, the chat, or it might be might be most convenient to if you raise your hand and we could and people could actually speak. Um, Please feel free also to turn your video on so we can see each other, um, especially when you're when you're speaking if you're comfortable doing so. Um, and uh, I'm going to be putting a link in the chat for uh, for a Google Doc that we can use to uh, take some joint notes on this discussion. Um, I will be taking notes, but would welcome other people to to contribute to this Google Doc 
as well. Um, and I believe Rob is going to be the main person responsible for watching the, the chat and for raised hands, right, Rob? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Great. So um, let's see, Sherry, are you going to be the one kicking it off? Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Great. Did it show up okay? Um, we let's see. We see your uh, it's kind of what presenter display? view. Uh, so might, I think if you do swap displays, will that work? Okay. Yeah. Is that better? Go. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Good. So uh, first off, um, I just wanted to say thank you uh, for everybody joining us in this discussion, um, especially since this is the last session of the last day. Um, like Bill said, my name's Sherry, um, and I'm going to be co-leading this discussion with uh, Gary, Jim, and Jesse. So um, our hope with this discussion um, is, is basically um, to try to come up with ways to make our data easier to share um, and analyze, um, especially by our colleagues, um, as well as to reduce our data footprint, um, especially when we're in a time right now where flops are a lot cheaper than bytes. So, um, Kind of an important issue right now. So Bill kind of went over some of these uh, logistics, um, but first we're going to be discussing two main topics. Um, the first one being data standardization, um, the second one output volumes. Um, we'll have about 80 minutes uh, total for the discussion with a break um, kind of around uh, 340 or so for about 10 minutes. And um, like Bill said, if you'd like to contribute, um, we ask that you use the raise hand feature um, or use the chat feature. Um, and for those of you who missed how to use uh, the raise hand feature, basically you just click that participation icon at the bottom um, and then that pops up a little window um, that you can go ahead and raise your hand in. So while brainstorming, we came up with four topics to, to discuss around the idea of standardization. Um, I was just going to go ahead and walk through each one of these briefly and provide some talking points on each um, just to help start the discussion. Um, in no way are we limiting the discussion. Um, we just kind of wanted to provide um, some potential starting points for the discussion. So MIP compliance. So what do we mean by uh, MIP compliance? Well, um, it, it's adopting the control vocabulary used within the CF community. So this includes like variable names, um, specific units for each of those variables, uh, specific descriptions that are attached to each one of these, um, as well as the attributes um, that are attached. Um, this also includes the benefit of uh, more uniform output coming from each one of our models. Um, by standardizing all these different attributes. But why MIP compliance? Um, so Gary touched upon this a little bit. Um, it makes our data more fair, which again is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, it's also becoming a required format uh, to publish to ESGF, the MIP compliance. So not outputting in a compliant form uh, causes other issues that makes our default um, data hard to use, like, you know, for example, the conversion of ocean CGS space to um, MKS. Um, also, um, the, finally, the, the translation exercise is, is kind of a black art. Um, not many people know how to do this, um, and it would just be a lot easier if it came from the model directly as an option. Um, and if you're not as familiar with the control vocabulary for CMIP6 and uh, the CMIP6 data request itself. Um, if you go to the Google Doc um, that Bill mentioned, um, I provided some links um, to exactly what the, the syntax is there um, in case you were curious. So another topic for discussion is if we should standardize the model output across all of the components, um, or in other words, abstract the output methods from each of the components and then put, put them into a shared library. Um, also up for discussion, um, asynchronous IO. Um, this would allow us to write IO while having the model continue on. Um, is this a good idea? Um, you know, it, it would hide a lot of the costs, but would we end up outputting more and contribute more to 
our output volumes um, if we go ahead and do that. So um, an interesting kind of perspective. Um, we can also discuss the hot button topic of timestamp values given to the average fields. So historically, we've had an off by one problem um, for average fields. Should we change this um, to be average of time bounds instead of being um, the timestamp at the end of the time? And finally, should we provide an option to output time series files directly from the model? Um, for example, we would want to keep the ability to output time slices for development work, but should we have an option to switch to time series output, for example, a production or a community simulation? Now, we're also hoping to discuss uh, ways to alleviate our output volumes. So, for example, uh, what's the minimum amount of output we need to output to provide the scientific analysis we, we would want to have done for a particular simulation? Um, should we be setting our defaults to no output and require users to add each variable by hand or have a minimum subset uh, that's smaller than what we currently output? Um, and to help guide this part of the discussion, we've added some sizes some, for some of the collections we hold. Um, for those totals for CMIP5 and CMIP6, those totals are, um, what we've provided to the community via um, ESGF. Um, there's also some extra data behind both of those data sets as well. So we have time series for each of those. And for CMIP5, we also have the time slice file still for those. Um, I'm not as familiar with CMIP5, but I, the last time I checked, I think CMIP6 was at 1.5 petabytes. Um, compressed uh, sitting behind the scenes of that that half a petabyte that we have listed here. So quite a bit of output. And finally, um, we also hope to discuss compression um, and the benefits of both lossless net CDF4 compression and lossy compression um, and, and how we should implement this within our workflow to make it easier for the users to compress their data. And, uh, you know, this is always, you know, uh, the elephant in the room, um, but along with the discussion, you know, we should always discuss how any initiative um, could get done. You know, we, we always have these great ideas, but we often lack the manpower and, you know, the funding to get some of this stuff done. Um, so we should be aware of this and also provide insights on how things can get accomplished. So with that, um, I'll open up the floor. I'll go ahead. Let's see. Do you still see my uh, PowerPoint presentation? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, I can leave that up for people um, as a starting point for now. Um, So should I? Yeah, I think David, sorry. Okay, well, if, if I can, yeah. Um, you know, Chuck brings up an interesting point about the cost of data storage and stuff. And I, and I know it's not as simple as just buying more disks for Cheyenne or whatever machine is there. But, um, you know, what, one of the things that's puzzled me and and we've talked about it a bit in our data task force meetings, is you know, the relative cost of buying and maintaining storage for Glade versus campaign and, and what are the relative costs of those? And, and I mean, because I think Gokhan highlighted this problem in the co-chairs meeting that even with compression, we're going to run out of space really soon, you know? And so, so I think there, there has to be a way that we can, you know, buy more storage or, or do something there. And then, you know, and, and I know, you know, again, Cheyenne, the, the folks administering Cheyenne have to be able to maintain this space and stuff like that. So, so I'm just curious about, 
what the general feeling is about this. Well, I mean, in this, you know, it, Dave, as you point out, I mean, the, the amount of space that we have available to us will always be filled up eventually, right? No matter how big it is, we'll always manage to fill it up. And so, I mean, the, the way to get around that, I mean, compression is a, is a step in the right direction. Direction Lossy compression is a bigger step, but the the biggest step we can take is just reduce the model output. I mean, we already know that a lot of our data isn't used by that many people. I mean, we've got a, you know, 10% of the data is used by 90% of our users. And, you know, the, the vast bulk of it is, is often used by maybe one or two people or just a very small number. So we will have to make some tough decisions about, you know, do we really need to say 400 ocean variables every, you know, by default, 300, or 400 atmosphere variables or more, three or 400 land variables or more. Um, I mean, I like sea ice, it's nice and small and, and, and plays well with others, but um, you know, we've, we've got a real data problem. And so it's not clear that you know, simply buying more and more storage, is, is, that's not gonna fix it. Can I say one thing, Dave uh, or Bill? So, okay, okay. so uh, just to come back to compression, so far we have been doing lossless compression and that's buying us some space. But I think, uh, I mean, probably Alison will say a little bit more. I think we, if you are going to essentially address this problem, one, uh, I'm not saying it's the only solution, but I think we need to really seriously consider the uh, lossy compression. And that's going to be essentially transparent to the user, as far as I can tell, because the end product will be essentially reduced size in its CDF file. So the second thing is that uh, we need to change the culture. And that is the most difficult part, I think, because it is, uh, I mean, we are a community project. We are a community model. And just an example is essentially CSM large, CSM2 large ensemble. We went out and asked people what variables they wanted to see. And then most of those variables, to the extent possible, are, are now included. But at the end, only one person may end up looking at that particular three-dimensional ocean variable. So I think we need to be more judicious in our choices of uh, variables, because we can't say, oh, if I'm going to look at it, I may need this variable five years down the road. And that has been going on. And in fact, we've encountered the same issue with the new uh, CSM2 simulations forced with CMIP5 uh, fields or forcing fields. And in that case, the default was essentially get again, as many variables as possible. And then we don't have the place to store those. I think there's a few others with hands up. Uh, Gunter, did you want to say something? Yeah, so um, well, I have uh, I have many questions, and uh, especially um, for um, other components. But because of a particular proposal I'm working on right now, I'm facing this storage issue um, right now. Just by loss lossless compression, the storage adds up to over 500 terabytes. So you know, that's a lot. So um, so my my first question. Um, is how easy is it to actually do lossy compression? Um, do, do you need like sp special, you know, special skills to do this? Is this like easily doable by anyone? Um, and the other question is like, with the lossy compression, do you lose information vital for your analysis? Have like all the other components checked whether, I, I know there was a study so I was trying to look into this, but has this study led to any like any specific variables that should not be stored as lossy in, in, in the in the lossy compressed file? That's my first question. So Hi, this is Alice, and I can um, talk a little bit. Um, 
glossy compression, there's many different types. There's some um, ones that are directly built into NetCDF uh, that you can use like bit grooming. There's some um, more advanced ones that um, people in Sizzle are working on incorporating. Um, maybe you're familiar with the CSM Lens project where we applied lossy compression to two of the ensemble members. In there, we use lossy compression as a post-processing tool. And we're hoping to make this tool available to people uh, soon, given the uh, interest in this. Uh, the question of, uh, do you lose information that's important? Um, if you are compressing data for your own use and you know how you're going to use it, you can easily um, pick parameters on the lossy compression to make sure that you don't lose things that are important to you. Uh, what's harder is when you have a data set like CSM lens data that we're putting out there that hundreds of people are using in different ways and we're not exactly sure how they're using it, uh, then we have to be a lot more conservative about um, what we do and make sure that we document it so people know what's been done. But um, there's two members of the CSM Lens 1 data that have been compressed with lossy compression. And as far as I know, and Gary knows, uh, people have been doing analysis with them and have not noticed a difference to that. So um, it, it's not a trivial issue, but it's something that I've been working on for a while in Haying also in Sizzle and others. And we hope in the future to have automated tools to suggest uh, the right amount of uh, information loss. And also we have tools that you can kind of analyze the data yourself to see uh, what the differences are. So that's hopefully a quick overview. Uh, I'm just going to uh, to follow up. Is, is the lossy compression in NetCDF given by NetCDF like reduce as much as the tools that you guys are uh, working on? Uh, it, it can. I mean, there's two issues, how much you reduce the data and then after you reduce it, what uh, the quality of it is. So uh, different compression approaches are better for different types of variables. If a variable is very smooth, it's pretty easy to compress. If a variable has uh, big jumps in the data and, uh, or a huge uh, dynamic range, it's harder to compress. So it's not that one compression method is always better for every variable. It depends, which I know is not very helpful, but that's the situation. There's also, Gunter, there's also a significant performance uh, question to that. The more compression you have, uh, the more expensive it could be. And many of these compression algorithms don't work in parallel, which is a big problem as well. Another thing, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Allison, uh, most of the so far work has been on the atmospheric model output for, uh, regarding lossy compression. And if you want to essentially bring in the other components such as ocean and sea ice, there needs to be some preliminary work done, right? In terms of the, how to approach the lossy compression. That's right. So uh, most of the work that uh, I've done is looking at what the effect of the data loss is on uh, someone's analysis. And we have focused almost all our time on the atmospheric data. And so definitely I would want to uh, look at the other component models more closely. Um, they can the, the reason that the atmosphere is easier is because basically there aren't fill values. I mean, if you just naively send the ocean data to a lossy compressor and don't tell it to treat the 10 to the 35th fill values differently, it's going to do a horrible job <laughs> compressing your data. So there's just little uh, things like that that, are, that um, can be taken care of. We just haven't done it yet. Um, if, I'm, if I may reflect on Jim's comment about um, the, like the post-processing, like how, how, I say, how, how, how much time does it take to actually do 
do this compression. Like I, I've, I've, I've experimented on small data set just on like on the, on the land ice side. And it can take quite some time for a relatively small data size. So it's like, is it, you know, do, do, do you need, do, is it going to be prohibitive to actually manage the data by compressing them afterwards? Um, I, well, again, I think it uh, really depends on uh, which approach you're using, how long it takes. And two, I think um, at some point you have to think of compressing data. Uh, maybe if you're doing a lot of analysis, you would um, uncompress the data first to do it all. And it, this would sort of be analogous to you have some data and you we're like writing it to tape and that takes a really long time. And then when you wanna do something with it, you wouldn't do the operations to it on tape, you would bring it back. So, um, I don't know, maybe Kevin or Haying wants to chime in more on that. Allison, I wanted to ask a clarification question. You said it's been, the compression analysis has been done on the atmosphere. So does that mean that the Pepsi Challenge ensemble members, it was only lossy compression on atmospheric history files and that the other components were untouched? That's correct. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I'd like to uh, bring in a few comments from the uh, chat, and some questions. Uh, one was a uh, suggestion from Kevin uh, Rader. Uh, could part of the data volume management strategy be to, to find some kind of criteria for keeping a unit of data, such as number of users in the last year or publications derived from it? Uh, some data lifetimes can be defined ahead of time to give researchers a deadline. And that way you can tell what data should be kept and what could be purged. Yeah, those are good ideas, Kevin. I, I like those. I, I, I want to keep this chat. Those are good ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the difficulties, though, is it's, uh, since people, the, the citation of data isn't quite as mature as citation of journals, sometimes it's hard to tell if a, a data set's been used in a publication or not. I mean, I can uh, get download metrics uh, easily, but that doesn't tell, tell us anything about whether or not a data set's been used. Until people start citing data sets regularly and making that part of their process, that's kind of hard to tell. Yeah. Oh, uh, I think Cecile, sorry, Cecile's had her hand up for a while. So but I think you're muted or audio is not working. Hmm. Okay, should be working now. <laughs> oh, wait, now say something. Can you hear me now? Yes. Sorry. OK, sorry. Sorry. I had like my microphone. I don't know. It was not working. There, there was a few comments because it's I, I'm reporting in with uh, for all the camp people because we had a discussion uh, last week about this. Because I think it's really important that we try to reduce the output that we generate in CAM and in other component too, but I can only speak for CAM, especially that we are going to triple the vertical resolution. And then uh, we have already a lot of issue right now, then uh, I think we should, we should really try to reduce uh, the output. And there were several ID that was bring it right now. We can control the output of CAM with nameless flag. And it would be nice to have like a tier one, tier two, tier three of data that we will bring. There are a lot of run that we output a lot of data and we don't really need it. Then it would be nice to have like, right now we have like history, atmospheric cooking group, it's the default flag and it output a lot of variable, less that we have an, as a nameless flag, but still we can, I think, reduce this. And there were a few ideas that we can, for example, output on a lower resolution grid, both for the vertical and the horizontal. 
when we do a higher resolution in the horizontal, we can have like, for example, for the quarter degree to get uh, one degree grid or some kind of grid. It can, we might need to do internal mapping that is conservative for the conserved variable. And also for all the 3D variable, we can probably output on less level. We are going to have probably something between 80 and 90 level, vertical level. But for the same six, the default is to output on 70 level. And we can have an option in um, CAM that would just say history. The, the default would be 70 level that it would be interpolated, but we can have an option that say history or level if for any reason you really need all levels. But I think most of the time, nobody really look at this. We can also shop the sponge layer. There was a few ideas and we were thinking to do a task force into CAM just to try to reduce our output. And I, yeah, and it's something I would continue to push. I have been pushing this for a long time uh, in CAM, but I think it's really a good time to do this as, as we are going to move to CAM 7, especially with her higher vertical resolution. And then the last thing that I want to say, I really like uh, the idea of having compression uh, include in the workflow, but it would be also nice to have compression script. And I think Alison mentioned that maybe we would have compression script that would be shared. Because right now we have, I got some compression script for Alper and from Ked, but I feel that it would be really sad that all the scientists start to write their own poorly written compression script. And it would be nice if we can have something that we share as CSM. And this is what I wanted to say. It's a lot of thing, but yeah. And I can send, I yet sent note to Bill about this, but I wanted to share with the group for discussion. And can I, can I just chime in there for, yes. for a second to kind of follow up on that? Um, thanks for sharing that, Cecile. And uh, I, I guess I, I'd be curious um, to hear to hear from other um, other components of, of people that are on, on online now, um, what what others think about having these different tiers of output and especially to what extent components should make their own decisions about what works best for that component and to what extent uh, this should be kind of a shared decision that we try to do something uniform across all of the CESM components in that respect. Hey, Bill, this is Peter Lawrence. And before you move on to other components. I, I just wanted to second what um, Cecile said. Uh, in particular, in the in the horizontal, <clears throat> you can have half the amount of data if you just slightly decrease the resolution. So instead of outputting on one degree, you could do 1.5 degree. And it kind of also agrees with at least the numerical method science, which where, where we all know that you know the the grid scale cannot really be trusted. So um, in that sense, you know, it's not that you you might be cutting away information you can't trust anyway. So, so that's also some science backing um, outputting on a lower resolution. I, I would like to say in the development of the next uh, CAM version, um, I think that the the CAM history capability that is, you know, averaging, keeping mins and maxes or, and, and all that is, is, is really good, but it should be pulled out into a, into a shared library external to CAM that the other components could use so we can kind of standardize across components. Um, right now, each component kind of has a, a different way of doing I.O. that causes confusion and so on. I think we have a few hand raised. So Dave, you want to go first and then Gustavo? Um, yeah, I'll just go ahead and speak for the sea ice. Um, so, you know, we've taken some steps to sort of control our output volume, even though 
the sea ice is tiny anyway. We're, we only cover 15% of the planet. So it's, you know, it's nothing. But, um, but the point is that like for, for CMIP, I introduced MIP compliant variables and I have a single flag that turns on or off those CMIP compliant variables. And so right there, that sort of builds in one level of output volume that I can play around with. Um, the other thing is that, um, you know, for the diagnostic packages, which I know are kind of outdated, but nonetheless, I think it's, it's good to at least have a minimum number of variables available for the diagnostic packages so that we can assess runs as they're going. Um, you know, and so that's another level, I think, that we've always thought about for the sea ice. And then there's a, an extra level beyond that, which is if we want to do budget analysis, you know, um, mass budget analysis or something like that, then we will need, you know, a lot more data, potentially daily and things like that. But that may only be for a few years of the run or something like that. But I think those are just some some thoughts from from my um, particular perspective on this. So, yeah, I just want to add that with Imam six, we already have that option. So there is a XML variable, ocean diag mode, which currently supports three different options: so it's production, spin up, or development. And then the amount of output is quite different between those. So for example, if you if you're doing something like what Gunter was saying, like a paleo-like study, you, you would initially have spin up as an option and then say minimally, and then you can change later on. So we kind of already have that option with the mom six. Gustavo, just a quick question. Um, do you also have the ability to output uh, CMIP6 uh, compliant variable names as well, just like the, the size model? Um, I heard a rumor, maybe. That's true. Yes, we do. Yeah, it's, uh, I wouldn't say all variables are summarized, but um, if I were to guess, I would like 90% of them are summarized. In so maybe, I missed oh, it, but go ahead. I, I just to clarify it. I thought that Mom Six actually spits out summarized variable names, right? Yes, yes, that's what I said. But I, okay, I couldn't hear. Fine. Yeah, I don't know. Like I, I don't think we have a hundred percent of them summarized. So okay, I got it. Very okay. close to. You know, 100%. Thank you. Sure. Um, just an extra layer on top of that. Um, you know, the the data request itself isn't entirely stable. You know, different things are, are changed, you know, di variable descriptions, for example. Um, is there an easy way you guys keep up with that? Or is it something where someone manually has to do a difference between, you know, versions in order to get, you know, any changes and then it's hand coded in into MOM6? I'm sorry, I couldn't find exact, follow exactly what you were asking. So it's is it specifically for the variable name change? Well, it can be a name change. Also for like the long name for um, a variable or, you know, you know, just the description, you know, sometimes even units are changed. Um, do you guys keep up with that at all? Or is it just kind of, you know, you know, put in the, it, it's hard coded in and it would take someone to go into the code to modify something if there's an update to the data request itself so yeah yeah there's two options so we things like units we do keep track a uh, name of the the variables and a long name and so on we do not and sometimes uh, you, you can change it and that's gonna like as long as you pass all the the tasks for bit for bit it will go into the main code um, no, I'll take that back. We do we do check sums on the diagnostics, so the it, it, it's going to catch if it changes the name of the variable too. Um, but um, th there's two ways one could adapt for a, a particular name changing. 
One is hard coded within MOM6. And the second one is what we call MOM interface, which as the name says, does the interface between MOM and CSM. And that's a tool that Alper developed. And within MOM interface, we can like, we can change for whatever we, we can call instead of sea surface temperature SST, we can call you know, sea surface temperature explicitly. Like we can do whatever we want, but both require manually changes. I think Dave might have his hand up again. <laughs> yeah, I'm just being a disturber. But um, anyway, the 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 other thing I was thinking of is I think these different levels of output is a great idea for just limiting what the models are writing out. But I think um, at some point there's only so much we can do with those different tiers, and there's just going to have to be hard decisions made maybe at the post-processing step where some of those variables are just left behind and just get removed from scratch or whatever, but um, or not post-processed at all. Um, but the other point I was going to make, um, and, and sort of similar to what, Sherry, you were asking about MOM6, is that um, one of my worries is that, say, CMEP7 comes along and they give us a brand new list of variable names you know and 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 so i'm a little worried about making these sort of mip compliant within the models because i'm going to have to redo this again for cmip 7 cmip 8 or maybe we're not participating in those but i don't know <laughs> It looks like Gary, do you want to say something? Yeah, uh, Dave, I, I, I wouldn't worry too much about CMIP 7 being a radical departure from CMIP 6. I mean, CMIP 6 was an enhancement of CMIP 5. They just made some minor changes. And I mean, they asked for more uh, fields and so forth, but the uh, established fields, there were no changes in the definitions. So other than additional fields being requested, I don't think we're going to see, you know, uh, ice area change from HI to HQ or, you know, some, some well, random thing like that. I would, but, I would counteract that, that. You know, I know that because this SI MIP body was formed, they completely changed all the CI's variable names. Um, so I had a lot of work just going from CMIP 3 to CMIP 5. So, um, yeah, so it's just, I mean, maybe maybe you're right. Maybe CMIP 7, there's not a big wholesale change, but it's just, yeah, so. Charlie, Zender, do you want to say something? Yeah. Uh, first, this is not what I look like. <laughs> um, going back to compression uh, and tying into the statement about CMIP 5 uh, not changing much, going into CMIP 6, that's of course true, but one, one way that it did change was in the support of compression that had had long avoided uh, and so now CMIP6 is all compressed with the deflate which is the only algorithm that NetCDF4 has historically supported by default and there's some really exciting news on that front that I, I wanted to make uh, workshop members available sorry uh, aware of and um, uh, a lot of this is due to Ed Hartnett, who, who wrote that CDF4 to begin with. So uh, he's at NOAA now. And uh, Ed and uh, I have developed a, uh, um, a codec repository that is uh, in the process of adding about six new codecs to the NetCDF backend 
And uh, these codecs include Z standard and from Facebook and Snappy from Google and LZ4. And what that will allow people to do in the future is uh, just not write the, the old deflate uh, compressed data, which is the lossy compression algorithm that, that CMIP6 uses, of course. And some of these algorithms like um, Snappy read and write 10 times faster. So when Gunther was asking about compression of land ice data and how fast that was, it's not that fast. But that's because deflate is, uh, if I understood your, your point, one of the only lossy compression that we're using is very slow and it's 30 years old. So um, with, this, with these new codecs that Ed and I are putting into uh, NetCDF, you can uh, do things faster. They'll compress more efficiently. And uh, the most recent NetCDF library, which uh, 4.74, I think, or maybe 4.73, added support for parallel uh, compression. So now um, the PIO2 library, Ed is working on putting the parallel compression into the PIO2 library and the models themselves will be able to hopefully speed up throughput. I don't know what the status of that is, but it's in the library support now from NetCDF. And then for, uh, for users, so for post-processing, um, you can look in the chat if you want and, and see, get an example of how these, uh, these new codecs will allow um, really modern compression algorithms to be accessed. And I think, you know, uh, that'll get a factor of two or so uh, in, in size uh, and uh, a speed up in compression as well. And uh, I think that's all I wanted to say. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Charlie, for for, for mentioning that, um, it's really great information. Um, question though, um, is that still all serial or is there parallelism as well? Like per, like PNET CDF, for example. Yeah, so um, thanks for that. I think that is in the library support is in NET CDF 4.7.3 for deflate parallel compression. So in IO, it could be invoked in a running model um, through PIO. So Ed Hartnett is working on that for the NOAA models, uh, actually implementing that. And then uh, the functionality applies to any of these codecs. So it's really the, the, the support is there for any um, to invoke compression through HDF5 in parallel, and now it's being exposed through NetCDF is probably the best way to put it. And so, yes, in parallel uh, is possible. That's great. Um, do, you, do you know um, how it ranks in performance compared to the PNetCDF? Is it comparable or, um, you know, where it kind of ranks? <laughs> it's really Sorry. a question for, for Ed Hart. Okay. But he rewrote PNET CDF in the latest uh, PIO library. So I think it's as good as it's going to be. Um, but really should talk to Ed. All right. I, um, it's, it's a it's about time that we said we would take a 10 minute break just to give everyone a little a little break before continuing on. Is this uh, Sherry and others leading the discussion? Is, um, do you feel like this is as good a time as any to take a, take a short break? And 
Yeah, let's let, let's go ahead and take a 10 minute break, everybody. Be back at uh, uh, 3.55 or 55 after. Thanks. It's great discussion so far. Thank Thanks you, everybody. All. Yeah. Sherry, I'm going to take over screen sharing for a minute just to share a slide letting people know that we'll be back at 3.55, um, if that's all right. Sure. Do you want me to actually continue sharing after uh, we get back to you? I didn't know if it was useful or not. Um, you won't hurt uh, my feelings. <laughs> up, no, I, I, don't, I don't have an opinion, honestly, up, up to you whether, whether you think it's helpful to have that. Okay. I wasn't there. sure if people popping up... Um, you know, I mean, it seems like people kind of know the topics and we can bring them up too if we, we need to. Yeah, so I don't. Maybe I'll um, just stop sharing. Sure, that's fine. Unless yeah. anybody has any objections and loves these slides. That seems fine. Okay, there you go. Okay. I like that better so we can see all the people or most of them anyway. Okay, thank you for your vote. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I won't share any more then.
right, Sherry, Gary, Jim, Jesse, you guys ready to resume? Yeah, I think so. Yep. Let me stop sharing. So take it away when uh, if you want to. One of you wants to kind of get things kicked back off. Uh. I guess I'll, I'll start. Well, thanks everybody for the uh, uh, excellent discussion so far, and the uh, uh, the chat. I've saved it several times already. Thanks, Dave, for that. Um, one of the things about standardization, well. I think my reason for now uh, advocating MIP compliance on all of our output is that, you know, in the era of CMIP3 and CMIP5, the, the specification for those was relatively modest and it really didn't cover that much of what we typically say. Whereas now with CMIP6, that's no longer true. I think, you know, what we're saving for CMIP6 will, will uh, you know, be uh, useful and usable for a very long time because they've really covered a lot of bases. You know, I think back to, I think CMIP 5 for the CIC only asked for like six fields or something like that it was very small. But for this time around, they've asked for considerably more. So it's much more useful to the community. And uh, I've gotten a number of requests, both, you know, privately and through the bulletin board saying, you know, I've completed a run with, with you know, my my copy of CSM. Where's Where's the code so I can see, you know, Make it compatible with the uh, CMIP five or CMIP six data because I want to I want to do that, and you know at this point we just don't have a general purpose utility for that. And we we've got the you know I've got my old Fortran code from CMIP five, which I hope no one ever sees again. Uh, the uh, stuff that Sherry and Kevin Paul and others wrote for CMIP six, but that's really CMIP six specific and it's very Cheyenne specific and it's just not really a general purpose tool. And I know that uh, on uh, CDO has a function called Seymour with it, but I haven't had a chance to explore that. Has, has anybody else tried that just out of curiosity? I'd like to hear about that. But uh, I'll, I'll get off the soapbox. And if anybody has anything else they'd like to, to ask or say about uh, MIP compliance and, and CSM output, please, uh, please chime in. Thanks. Um, well, I guess I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just ask as a follow-up to that. I mean, if, if, does, does anyone see any issues with moving our model output to just be MIP compliant? And I think Gary, by, by MIP compliant, you, you're referring specifically to the variable names and units, right? Right. Yeah. Just, just those things. And I, and actually on top of that, I'd also like to see better metadata coming out of the model. Because right now it's it's pretty sparse, but uh, that's that's a secondary issue. Yeah, I mean just names and units, not you know not their their file name style or anything like that. Just names and units. Thanks. Yeah. So so would anyone see issues with if, if that was just the standard way that we produced output moving forward? Would there be any problems with that? Can I say something here? Then I was thinking that we could. There are people. I'm, I'm really fine with this. I think we should go right, and move with this. I know that there are people that are very reluctant to this because it, they will have, have to update, update all the script. But I was thinking that one solution could be that we keep the two name of the variable and they would have the possibility to do a F include in their own run on the old variable that they have it would not be like if we do a run that like lands or run for the community but at least they will have the option if we keep the name the old name 
we will have two names, and I don't know what's the name of temperature in a semi, but we will have T, like the only T, and we will have temperature, or let's say it's the name in semi, and they would have the option to add F include to put the old name. And I think if there would be this option, maybe there will be less reluctance. I don't know. It's just something to, just an idea to, to help people that don't want us to move to summarize because they have this script that's written in all the, the old way. Just an idea. Uh, uh, Dave, looks like your hands up. Yeah, I, I just, in Keith Lindsay said something in the chat about this too, that the problem is, is that, you know, we may have a model variable and there's no one-to-one -one mapping with a CMIP variable, right? And so, so we need to have the flexibility there as Cecile is talking about where you're able to write one or the other, you know, like for example, I went looking for this one variable uh, in the atmosphere and the CMIP name was CLWV or something like that. Well, that's the addition of the total ice water path and the total liquid water path in CAM. And, you know, you could imagine in CAM, you want to look at those two things separately. So, so I think um, it's, it's not just as simple as saying, we're going to switch over to the CMIP variables. Hey, uh, Charlie, looks like your hand's up. Yeah, I, I'm not, I want some clarification as to whether the proposal is to switch to CMIP variable names or to add the CMIP, uh, or sorry, the CF uh, or CMIP variable name, which are different as additional attributes to the existing variable and leaving the variable's name unchanged, which would preserve functionality of, exi of existing scripts, but allow people writing new scripts to make sure they have the variable they want. Uh, the, the proposal is to replace uh, CSM variable names with MIP, the exact MIP equivalents where appropriate and advocate for new CF uh, standard names and, and so forth for those that are missing and also uh, units uh, match one-to-one. -one. For example, uh, TAM dumps out um, precip in meters per second, but uh, CMIP requires kilograms per meter squared per second is a flux unit instead. So those would match also. I mean, it's a simple conversion. Some others are not, but to, you know, so they map one-to-one -one because I've been through this exercise of translation several times now, and it's extremely error prone and tedious and difficult. And it's, uh, it's a lot of work. And if, you know, if we do it once in the model, then we don't have to ever have to do that again. Well, I, uh, you're probably aware that really CMIP is by and large CF. And so when you say the CMIP name or the MIP name, it's often the CF name. And CF as a standard only suggests that that standard name be listed as the standard name, not that it be listed as the variable name. True, but for, I mean, you can put, you can put, you know, the CF standard name as an attribute and call the, you know, call the field whatever you want. But, yes. you know, we've already, there's already a pretty much a, a de facto standard coming out of CMIP now for, you know, a number of iterations of what the short name for a variable should be. You know, TS for surface temperature, TAS for, mm -hmm. uh, you know, temperature at, at two meters and that sort of thing. If we had if we had clever enough analysis codes, they wouldn't care what the short name was of the variable and only look for the standard name, then this becomes a moot point. But our analysis codes and our, you know, the way that we handle our data don't operate like that. So um, so here, here's a technical question because I've been wondering this too. Can you search, can you open an Etsy 
netcdf file and search for a variable attribute name? Or do you actually have to load each variable and search its attributes individually? You have to load each variable and search for its attributes individually because the attributes are really held by the variable. So when Charlie says loading the variable, I think that's just loading the variable metadata. Yes. To load the variable values, which is how I interpreted your question, Rob. I, no, I, I was referring to the metadata. So if you have okay. a script, if you have a script that only has the CF standard names in it, and you're cracking open a, a CESM file to look for that variable, you're going to have to load the metadata for every variable to to find the real variable you're looking for. Because you can't just search right. for the for the variable name, right? That that is very fast in NetCDF when you open up the file. My understanding is that the library loads all of the metadata into memory when you open the file. And so, okay, and so it's already from opening from the moment that you open the file, searching the metadata in memory is fast because it's already been read. Okay, so then maybe adding the the CF name as a metadata, uh, as an attribute to the variable would be a good first step. All right, I would agree with that, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the thing is that, um, you know, like I, kn I know all the CMEP CICE variables are not CF compliant names. For example, CICE concentration is SI cons. And that's not the CF standard name for sea ice concentration. Um, so, you know, so I think that there's there's a mixture of things here that you can't just assume that CF standard names equal CMIP names. That's interesting. Does anybody know why that is? I mean, why why are why are there differences between the CF standard names, the standard sort names that CF doesn't specify, like Charlie said, CF, the CF standard doesn't require you to name a variable a certain short name. But I, I should think it would make sense to have, you know, a, perhaps CF can recommend a short name or something like that. But we're getting down in the weeds. I want to hear about other, other aspects of this too. And Gary, I think looking at uh, the CMIP6 data request, I think only a handful of variables actually fell into that category where the, sh the standard name didn't match the, the short name. So for the most part, they do match. And the story yeah. behind that, I have no idea. Maybe someone has a script somewhere, I don't know. Yeah, I thought the overlap was pretty big. Thanks for, thanks yeah. for checking. Yeah. Gary, I will mention that I think mom six uses CMIP names for its output variables. Yeah, Gustavo mentioned that earlier. So that's that's good to hear. That's that's nice. Thanks. So I'm actually curious about the land group. Um, you know, we didn't really hear very much on their opinion of, you know, switching to uh, CF standard names um, and also um, limiting the amount of output. Um, I know working with them for CMIP6, you know, they actually took uh, how much they were outputting very seriously and they tried to reduce it as much as possible, um, including, you know, outputting things on just one grid and then creating functions to, to translate between those grids just so they didn't have to output more data. Um, so I'm kind of curious um, on, on their perspective on this topic. Dave, Lawrence, you want to give a hand raised? Yeah, I can answer. Or Will, do you want to go ahead? No, go ahead, Dave. Okay. Um, 
Yeah, so I, I uh, we have not explicitly discussed it across the working group, but I don't see likely there'd be any opposition to moving towards CF variable names or Seymour. I think it would, uh, would make modeling comparisons easier for us and we participate in a lot of them. Um, I'm not too worried about converting our scripts, um, especially if there's some tool to help. And we have gone through and tried to reduce our output a lot. Um, Part of it is, it is going towards this the thing of having multiple streams of output, not exactly by default, but, but when you call the CMIP output, the user defined mod, um, which is still a bit cumbersome. But when we do use that, we can get all the output. And in particular, there's a lot of things that are only required at like annual timescales, which allows us to save quite a bit of space, especially for 3D fields. So um, we're all in on trying to keep our data down um, and we've done most of what we can do, but we can always uh, circle back around and try again. I guess the only thing that I'd add is, you know, some of the vector output that we're generating, um, we're definitely getting requests from the user community for tools to convert that vector output to gridded output for their analyses. And we have you know, kind of a beta version of the code of a Python script to do that, but it seems like a you know, more generic tool that we could use help making more efficient. Um, so as much as that can be a CESM initiative and not just a land model working group initiative, that would be helpful. Yeah, thanks, Will. I'm going to jump in. This is Gary. Um, I mean, we also have just released to the high res MIP some of our uh, spectral element data, which we have never released before. So um, we're going to have to provide some tools to you know, do interpolation to a regular, you know, a lot, some sort of lat long grid so people can take a look at that stuff. And um, so that's, you know, another thing that could go into our toolkit that, you know, aside from, I mean, NCL provides some of that func functionality, I know, but I think, you know, we should be able to provide some other tools that, you know, maybe are a little more flexible or, or faster or something like that for people who want to look at these uh, you know, spectral element grid, especially when you get up to the any twenty, any one twenty, and any two forty. I mean, these are very large data sets. So uh, we need some really good tools to handle those. I think, along with the vector output from CLM, that is, is that's another example. Thanks, Dave Bailey. You want to go, and then Negan Savani. Yeah, and just back to Sherry's point about the variable request being CF standard names i i'm guess i'm very confused here because when i go look at cf standard names it's these really long variable names like for example c ice area fraction um and that's not what i'm providing for cmap it's it's si cons so can you sort of explain to me the distinction there <laughs> You know, I probably got my terms mixed up, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to think. I, I could have sworn it was, maybe it's standard name. Not sure. Not. Does that look more right or more correct? Sorry. I, I don't know, but I'm You're just. Gary, can, can you be my lifeline? <laughs> yeah, I'll, 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 let's take this offline, Dave. Let's, yeah. I'll, I'll, okay. Okay. We've got other people that want it. I'll, I'll write, I'll write you. And Negan, do you have your hand raised? Uh, yes. Uh, hi, my name is Negan Sobani. I was wondering if there are, like this is a more general question, and I was wondering if there are any efforts in making a, basically a Python package, like a, for example, Worf has this Worf Python package, which includes a lot of like diagnostics and interpolation routines and a lot of things for Worf specifically. I was wondering if there are any efforts to put together such a thing for CESM. And if there are not, we should think about like, someday we should think about doing such a thing. Yeah. Hey, Don, um, gosh, I'm gonna space his name now. Help me out, Keith. Uh, no, 
know? Do you know who I'm talking about? Uh, you talking about Matt? Yeah, Matt Long has been working on Python tools for data analysis that I think um, you may be interested in if you don't yeah. know. Yeah, I think Dominic is starting to talk with those folks more. So I, I was scrolling through the chat a little bit, and um, I noticed a couple mentionings of um, the timestamps for averaging fields and also standardizing um, the time that's outputted in, in all the files, you know, making that standard across all the components. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? No thoughts, I guess, right? Everybody is so silent. <laughs> yeah, I, I know um, it was mentioned that, you know, sometimes it makes uh, post-processing a little bit more difficult with Python tools. You know, for example, like the ocean, you know, can output uh, starting year 0000, which Python complains, you know, it doesn't exist and, you know, isn't valid. Um, do, do it, does, is this a problem for anybody else? Yeah, I'm having several issues. This is Dan Marsh with, with uh, looking at um, the history files out of uh, CSM, the atmospheric history files. Well, one problem, it's not a problem. I just have to do it every single time. It's if I'm reading monthly means, I have to um, uh, open with, with um, the turning off the CDF time, um, uh, whatever it's, it, um, how it interprets time. Um, then I average across the um, uh, uh, dimension of um, time bounds to create the mean time bounds. And then I reset, then I reopen it, or not reopen it, but then I tell it to, to read in the times, you know, whatever. I, I forget the commands, but I have to issue about four commands every time I put, use X-ray to open up an eight zero file simply to get the monthly, the date in the file to be the middle of the month and not the, 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 month, the date at which the data was written, which is always a problem. So, so that when your plots are right, you're not one month shifted every single time. And then all of the paleo stuff I'm doing, anything where I'm doing a, time, uh, um, a run where I'm starting up as a, well, actually not even that, any run that is a perpetual year 2000 run where I'm starting from year zero, I'm just running out so that uh, will open up um, unless I turn that off simply because um, I forget what it is, but X-ray doesn't like dates below, below like 1750 or 16. I forget what the date is, but, but those two issues are one, uh, two issues that I'm always dealing with in terms of time problems. Maybe I'm the only person that has this problem. No, Dan, you're exactly right. I mean, this is one of the issues that I get this question a lot is, you know, I open up an H0 file and it says it's February 1st. Why does it say that? It's like, no, that's the January average. So that's, yeah, and it's this off by one thing also that I think needs to be corrected. And also, it would also be nice to have all the component models standardized on, uh, you know, like coordinate metadata. Like, you know, time is always called time and it always has the same units and it's, it's metadata is always the same across components because in some components, it's like time underscore bounds, B-O-U-N-D-S. Other ones, it's time underscore B-N-D-S. Sometimes it's float, sometimes it's double. And it's, uh, you know, that should be something I think that across all the components should be exactly the same. You know, the specifications of the, of the coordinate arrays for you know, lat latitude, longitude, latitude, time, and all that stuff should be exactly the same across all components. 
so we can get around these issues. Yeah, because there's some amazing functionality in XRA and pandas, whatever it is you want to call it, that allows you to group by season. So you can open up a file and say, give me the seasonal averages in one line or two lines, right? But it's wrong because <laughs> of the way that it interprets the month field or the date field. So you have to know to not do to, to do that average across time bounds to get the right date for that thing and then ask it to do the seasonal averaging. Um, and it has, you know, that, and that can automatically be paralyzed very, very quickly because you can just open up, you know, use Dask to do a lot of this stuff, but you'll get the wrong answer. Um, it, if you don't know that, it, you know, I, I, I ran into this problem. I had to meticulously sort of figure out, calculate it by hand and then calculate it and see it was wrong and then had to shift it. So, um, people will get, um, will be publishing the wrong figure if they just think they're grabbing the x-ray stuff. Oh, I'm going to group by season. There's my DJF average for precip, and it's going to be wrong. So that to me feels like a problem that it would be fairly easy for us to solve as long as there's kind of consensus that we should that we that we should change that. And so I guess I just ask: Is there is there any objection to uh, from anyone on here to changing that convention? The convention being that the date and date sec in the file are not the date at which the data is written, but the the central the center of the time uh, of the time bounds array. Right. That would be great. The, the standard rebuttal to that is that TM spits out by default instantaneous output, like the CO two BMR and the other greenhouse gas BMR values are instantaneous values that are written at the end of the interval. And if you identify time value in a time mean file as the midpoint of the interval at which that's the time mean, then it will technically be incorrect for the instantaneous fields that are in that file. And so you're trading convenience for incorrectness. That's the standard response. And we've had debates about this for many, many years. Could those yeah, values so, be so when you mix up a so when you mix up a, a colon A and a colon I fields in a file, um, you, you, then what does the date field mean? Because some of the some well, of them well, for, that that's where the debates get into. If, if you have a colon A, then you should be looking at time bounds. You shouldn't be looking at the instantaneous time value, but it, it throws off users because users don't appreciate that. And that's why Gary gets tons of questions over the years and, and Adam too and others. So a question might be, you know, I mean, uh, NetCDF4 is able to take, you know, multiple time dimensions, um, but obviously we use um, currently PNET CDF, which is basically net CDF3, so we don't have that available to us. Um, could those just be outputted as a different stream with the correct um, timestamp on those? You know, have all the average fields in one stream, have instantaneous on the next. Um, I know it may complicate things with the way, you know, the history variables are specified you know, within uh, the nameless file, but but could that be a possibility? I imagine it could be, but you would need a CAM developer to yeah. weigh in on that. <laughs> I also noticed too, that we only have about five minutes left. So we should probably, you know, start summarizing, um, you know, and also, you know, briefly mentioned maybe pass forward. Um, sounded like we had a lot of traction with um, the compression, um, including um, adding, you know, it within a workflow script itself. Um, you know, do people still think that's a good idea? Um, you know, adopting some kind of conventions. It seems like a lot of the components are on board um, if they haven't already gone in that direction already, um, you know, who is going to be responsible for that? Um, and is that, you know, something we all want to do? And also, um, you know, the timestamps uh, on the files. Uh, Bill, 
said it's an easy fix. So it sounded like he volunteered to do this for everybody. Um, I don't know if Bill wants to, to mention, <laughs> to clarify that or not. Um, but no, that wasn't what I had implied. <laughs> Sorry, Bill. <laughs> um, you know, just some final thoughts maybe on, on these topics. Or should we put anybody else, or should I put anybody else under the bus here? Well, wasn't, there was also some interest in, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a toolkit, for example, like what, what, what Wharf has, you know, for these various interesting things that, and utility things and utilities that people like to do with CSM. But uh, I just want to summarize and say, I thought the discussion was great. I mean, it went off in directions I wasn't anticipating, which is fantastic. And uh, I, I really like to thank everybody for, for uh, chiming in and, and and letting us know what you think. Thanks so much. Okay. Any other final? Thoughts or comments from from anyone? For those organizing the discussion, Sherry and others, any 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 other last last parting words? Yeah, maybe just a second, um, Gary, I'm thanking everybody for, for their input. Um, it was really insightful. Um, it was also really great to hear, you know, from a wide variety of backgrounds and, you know, people that this would, would impact. So that's, that's important going forward. And everybody that's interested in the uh, next workshop for the um, model data uh, EarthCube thing, please send Doug an email. Uh, he's interested in getting, we're interested in getting as many people as possible to participate. These virtual meetings really make that possible. So the more voices we hear from, the better job we'll be able to do. Thanks. All right, well, I'll get on the thanking bandwagon. And yeah, I also want to thank everyone for, for coming and attending this uh, session. And um, yeah, we will definitely have uh, kind of some targeted discussions, I think, following from this sort of figuring out next steps. So um, yeah. Thank you all. And talk to you all later. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, we, already have a, we already have a GitHub issue even. So progress. <laughs> Thank you so much, champ. <laughs>
Elizabeth, is there any, yeah. any other wrap up that? Um, no, just if you have uh, many presentation slides that you want posted and I can follow up with anyone else. And um, we've got the video saved, so that'll get posted. And if, if anyone contacts you, they can watch it on YouTube. So from the CDD Great. page. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Yeah, I'll have, um, I guess I'll have speakers send, send their slides directly to you just so that, you know, yeah. so that they can confirm that they indeed want them, are yeah, comfortable with that'll having be them perfect. shared. And, uh, okay. Mine's on its way. Okay. Great. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it was, it was really good. Um, lots of good discussion. So. Thanks again for all of your help and support with all of this, Elizabeth. The help, sure. for helping this all run smoothly. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this is the end. So yeah. um, that's good. And How are you celebrating tonight? <laughs> oh, uh, pizza. We've already decided. <laughs> well deserved. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, well, I'll okay. see everyone online. We've got um, co chairs on Tuesday. So thank okay. you. Good. All right. Thanks. Take Bye. care, everybody. All right. I can go ahead. Do you need this open?